morning, everyone. Good morning, Zoom. Good morning, FB. October marks as the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you for choosing to spend your Saturday morning with us. And I'm Lirio. I'm going to be your host for this morning's webinar about uh, Check a Breast Cancer Awareness. And it's my pleasure to co-host this morning's webinar with a... Uh, mm one of the top surgeons of the Medical City, South Luzon. He graduated from the University of Santo Tomas and had his general surgery, surgery residency training at Chinese General Hospital and Medical Center and fellowship in HPB surgery and liver transplantation at Kaohsiung Changgung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. He's a fellow of Philippine College of Surgeons, Philippine Association of HPB Surgeons, and Philippine Society of General Surgeons. Currently, he's the head of the Liver Transplantation Unit of CGHMC and the Medical City South Luzon's uh, German of Department of Surgery. Let us all welcome Dr. Noriel Gerald A. Salvador. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Thank you all Dom. for that sweet introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, to all our panels, to all our viewers in FB and Zoom. Uh, so thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. And of course, I would like to thank personally thanks our sponsors, uh, DKSH Accord and Medtronic, for this wonderful support for the Department of Surgery. Yes, and yes. of course, our, ano, our mission today is to spread breast cancer awareness. No, Ma'am Lirio? Yes, Doc. Actually, excited ako kasi syempre as, as a, isang nanay at babae in my 40s, so gusto ko rin malaman at risk na ba ako or uh, papano ko ba ma, maiiwasan na magkaroon ng breast cancer. And bilang uh, one of my auntie is a breast cancer survivor since 1986. So, yun yung pinaka nakaka-excite ngayong uh, umaga na to. And to add din, Doc, ha, this is part of the celebration ng Medical City South Luzon, 14th anniversary. Yes, yes. Happy anniversary yes. ng Medical yes. City South Luzon. Kaya, kaya aside from the fact na we're gonna be learning about breast cancer this morning, isa sa mga aabangan ng mga viewers natin sa Zoom at saka sa FB. Yes, yung may mga surprise sa kanila. Prices, diba? yes. <laughs> Siyempre, extra generous ang Medical City. We will be giving away uh, TMCSL merchandise. Yan. And one very important prize. Yes. 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 From huh? the Department of Surgery. Napaka-exciting. Sana nga manalo din ako doon. Kaya lang, <laughs> syempre, disqualified ako doon sa grand prize. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, di na natin papatagilin. So, lahat ng sinabi mo kanina ng mga concerns mo, yun ang actually ang ating objectives. Yes. Pero ang pinaka-ano natin is Lalo na in this time of pandemic, yung especially those who are concerned with their health, with their breast, na hindi, ma, hindi rin matakot magpa-check up. No? Yun yung pinaka-primary natin. Magpa-check up sa doktor para ma-screen ka agad kung kinakailangan. Now, so without further ado, we will start our uh, series of lecture for everyone, especially for our patients and other doctors. Let me introduce to you our moderator. This slide, please. Our moderator for our lecture will be our former uh, chief medical officer of the Medical City South Luzon. He is also our head, present head of our hospital credentials and privileging committee. He is a former chairman, my boss, no? in the Department of Surgery and director of medical and quality improvement. He is also uh, really, uh, associated with Asian Hospital and Medical Center as being former head of Hospital Credentials and Privileging Committee. So let me introduce to you uh, one of the very good, uh, best surgeon gen in general surgery, advanced minimal access surgery, Dr. Norman D. Manlapas. Thank you, Doctor, for uh, accepting our invitation. Maraming salamat, Mr. Chair, at isa pong mapagpalang umaga sa ating mga tagapagsubaybay ngayong Sabado. And salamat po, gaya ng sinabi ng mga 
ating mga guwapo at uh, magandang uh, co-host kayong umaga na ito for spending your Saturday morning with us. Ngayon pong araw na ito, kagaya po ng sinabi nila, na tayo po ay maglalaan uh, ng mga magaganda at uh, napakagagaling na dalubhasa sa larangan ng paggagamot sa tinatawag na breast cancer. Ito po bang sakit na ito ay talagang kailangang katakutan or kailangang matutunan lang natin ang mga bagay-bagay uh, bilang pasyente upang tayo ay makakop at tayo po ay uh, mapagtagumpayan natin ang uh, mga mga bagay-bagay na dala nitong sakit na ito. So for this morning, ganito po ang ating magiging house rules. Uh, habang pong tayo ay... Uh, Uh, merong speaker na nagsasalita, aking uh, uh, inire-request po na ating mute muna yung uh, ating uh, mga Zoom at saka yung ating mga aparato. So lahat po ng interferences ay hindi papasok. Uh, para sa ating mga tugas bye uh, meron po tayong question and answer phase uh, mamaya pero makatapos na po ito ng uh, makatapos na po makapagbahagi ng ating mga dalubhasa ng kanilang mga lectures for this morning. So without further ado, ating uh, pong, uh, pagsimulaan na ang tinatawag na discussions for the day. No? So for the first speaker, I would like to uh, introduce to you ang uh, isa pong aking colleague, no? ating, aking pong, uh, uh, isang uh, colleague sa Department of Surgery. Pwede po na ba natin ipakita yung uh, slide niya upang ating mailathala yung kanyang credentials. Our uh, first speaker is a graduate of the University of the East, the Ramon Magsaysay Medical, uh, Medical Memorial Center. And uh, siya po ay uh, nag-aral ng kanyang general surgery residency sa Quezon City General Hospital. And she is a fellow of the following societies. Siya po ay fellow ng Philippine College of Surgeons, Philippine Society of General Surgeons, as well as the PALES, the Philippine Association of Laparoscopic and Endoscopic Surgeons, And she is affiliated, of course, with uh, the Medical City South Luzon at saka sa kanyang Alma Mater Training Hospital, which is the Quezon City General Hospital. Siya po ay uh, uh, magbabahagi sa ating ngayon ng mga bagay-bagay ukol sa the basics or mga fundamental things na kailangan malaan natin tungkol sa sakit na breast cancer. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you this morning our first speaker in the person of Dr. Olivia Alonso. Olive, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Breast Cancer Awareness Month celebration here at the Medical City, South Luzon. And this lecture will cover the following topics. History on how the Breast Cancer Awareness Celebration came to be, definition of breast cancer, types of breast cancer and its symptomatology, demographics, epidemiology, risk factors, and the benefits of screening. It was in October 1985 when the National Breast Cancer Awareness Month was first celebrated in the U.S. by the American Cancer Society and a pharmaceutical company, specifically the Oncology Division of AstraZeneca. The pink ribbon was introduced in 1992 as New Yorkers lobbied for more funding in the breast cancer research. The pink ribbon became a symbol for breast cancer awareness and has been adopted worldwide. And the goals are to educate women about the breast cancer and its complications, to promote early detection tests such as mammography, among other examinations, so that treatment is easier and less expensive. Breast cancer is a disease in which cells of the breast grow rapidly and out of control. It can begin in any of the different parts of the breast. The breast is made up of three part, main parts, lobules, ducts, and the connective tissue. The lobules are the glands that produce milk. The ducts are tubes that carry milk to the nipple. The connective tissue, which consists of fibrous and fatty tissue, surrounds and holds everything together. The type of breast cancer depends on which cells in the breast transform or turn into cancer. Most breast cancers arise in the ducts or the lobules. The breast is rich in lymphatic drainage and blood supply so that a small lesion can readily metastasize to the different parts of the body. 
These are the common types of breast cancer according to the tissue of origin. We have the invasive ductal carcinoma where the cancer cells grow outside the ducts into the other parts of the breast tissue. Invasive lobular carcinoma is where cancer cells spread from the lobules to the breast tissue that are close by. Both can spread or metastasize to other parts of the body other than the lymph nodes in the axilla or in the layman's term, the armpit or the underarm. DCIS and LCIS stands for ductal carcinoma in situ and lobular carcinoma in situ where cancer is confined to the basement membrane. It is cancer that has not yet spread into the surrounding tissue. It is considered a non-invasive or pre-invasive breast cancer. Metastatic breast cancer is essentially a stage 4 or an advanced breast cancer. Cancer that has spread to the different parts of the body like the bone, lungs, skin, liver, and brain. And the bone being the most common site of distant metastasis. Less common types are breast cancers of connective tissue origin and the inflammatory breast cancer. Breast cancer of connective tissue origin, just to name a few, include angiosarcoma, which is a form of cancer cell cancer that starts from cells that line the blood vessels or lymph vessels. Phylloidus tumor, a rare breast tumor that starts in the connective tissue of the breast. Paget's disease of the nipple is characterized as an eczema-like changes to the skin of the nipple and the area of the darker skin surrounding the nipple. It is important to note that it can be mistaken for a fungal infection of the skin of the nipple. It's usually a sign of breast cancer in the tissue behind the nipple. The inflammatory breast cancer accounts for 1 to 5% of all breast cancers. It tends to develop in the cells of the milk ducts. Skin dimpling is pathognomonic and is a result of the blockage of the lymph vessels in the skin. There are rare types of breast cancer, and these are some of the pictures of actual patients that I encounter in my practice. Lymphoma can also occur in the breast as well as melanoma. Lymphoma account, accounts for less than 1% of all breast cancers, while melanoma is less than 5%. What are the symptoms of breast cancer? Breast cancer can manifest in different forms. A lump or a mass in the breast is the common, most common symptom. Other symptoms pertain to the changes in the skin of the breast, like thickening or swelling of a part of the breast, redness, and the classic Puderange description in French used to describe skin, skin dimpling that resembles an orange peel texture of the skin. Pain with or without a palpable mass is a symptom of DCIS. Nipple discharge is fairly a common symptom. And take note, a mammographic finding su suspicious of malignancy cannot be overlooked. Patients will come to the clinic without symptoms but will show you her mammography result suspicious findings of malignancy. On demographics, while cancer impacts people of all ages, races, ethnicities, and genders, it does not always affect them equally. Differences in genetics, hormones, environmental exposures, and other factors can lead to differences in risk among different groups of people. As shown in the figure, we can see the incidence increases continuously with age. Increasing age was cited as the most important risk factor for breast cancer in a study of prevalence in the Philippines by Adrian Laudico and Arjenal et al. in 2019. On gender, it is widely accepted that women are most commonly affected by breast cancer, and only about 1% of breast cancers are diagnosed in men. On race and ethnicity, in general, white Caucasian women are more likely to develop breast cancer than women of other races or ethnicities. Asian and Pacific Islander women are less likely to develop 
breast cancer as opposed to Caucasians. These graphs show us that globally the trend is continuously increasing in prevalence as shown by two independent research studies. Breast cancer is currently the second most prevalent cancer globally. In the same time period in 2020, over 2 million new cases of breast cancer in both sexes were diagnosed globally. The Philippines is among the highest incidence of breast cancer in Southeast Asia, as reported and published in a local paper authored by Laudico et al. in 2009. It ranks third highest in Asia by Globocan in 2003 from Taiwanese studies, and the graph shows the incidence and mortality rate in the country by WHO in 2020. Breast cancer is the most prevalent surpassing lung cancer in 1987. It ranks third highest in terms of mortality. In a similar study by foreign authors for PhilHealth breast cancer campaign by Wu and Hoffman showed that the Philippines has the highest incidence rate of breast cancer in Asia and continuously increasing in incidence among 187 countries over a 30 period 30-year period from 1980 to 2010. Similarly, WHO reported that there were almost 30,000 new cases of breast cancer diagnosed for both sexes in the country, about 17.7% of the 153,000 new cases reported in 2020. Based on the same study by WHO in 2020, breast cancer is the third most number of cancer-related deaths in the Philippines and has the highest five-year prevalence among all cancers in the country today. So to summarize the statistics, breast cancer is the most common site-specific cancer in women and is the leading cause of death for women aged 20 to 59. Breast cancer accounts for 30% of all newly diagnosed cancers in women and about 14% cancer-related deaths. The Philippines has the highest incidence in rate in Asia by Wu and Hoffman in 20, 2010 and the Philippines ranks 12th largest population and has the 12th highest incidence rate of breast cancer in the world. Here is an overview of risk factors and these are classified as either factors that are controllable or uncontrollable. Risk factors that you cannot control such as age, family, personal history, race, radiation, genetic factors, menstrual history, and reproductive history. So getting older, the risk for breast cancer increases with age. Most breast cancers are diagnosed after the age 50. However, on some occasion, it can also affect women as early as 20 years old. Personal history of breast cancer or non-cancerous breast diseases. Women who have had breast cancer are more likely to get breast cancer a second time. Some non-cancerous breast diseases such as atypical hyperplasia or either ductal or lobular carcinoma in situ are associated with higher risk of getting breast cancer. Family history of breast or ovarian cancer. A woman's risk for breast cancer is higher if she has a mother, sister, or daughter of first degree relative or multiple family members on either her mother's or father's side of the family who have had breast or ovarian cancer. Having a first degree male relative with breast cancer also raises a woman's risk. Genetic mutations, inherited changes or mutations to certain genes such as BRCA1 and BRCA2. Women who have inherited this genetic changes are at high risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And in fact, there is 80 to 85% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer and 20 to 40%
lifetime risk for developing ovarian cancer. Previous treatment using radiation therapy. Women who had radiation therapy to the chest or the breast, like for the treatment of Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma before the age 30, have a higher risk of getting breast cancer later in life. Reproductive history. Early menstrual periods before age 12 and late menopause after age 55 expose women to hormones longer, raising their risk of getting breast cancer. So this is related to prolonged exposure to estrogen. On air pollution, exposure at work to solvents, aromatic amines found in dyes and textiles, and uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are present in uh, vehicles' exhaust fumes. And these compounds are carcinogenic and are known to cause breast cancer. White or Caucasian women are likely to develop breast cancer than Asian or Eastern women. Risk factors you can control, such as obesity, exercise, breastfeeding, alcohol, hormone, hormone replacement therapy, um, birth control pills, and nulliparity or not having children. Not being physically active and lack of exercise. Women who are not physically active have higher risk of getting breast cancer. Inactivity leads to gaining weight and to obesity. Being overweight or obese before and after menopause, older women who are overweight or obese have a higher risk of getting breast cancer than those at a normal weight. Estrone, a derivative of estrogen, is produced in the fatty tissues. The more fatty tissues one has, the more estrone is produced. There is an increased conversion of androstenedione to estrone in the adipose tissue and it has been established that estrogen promotes rapid cell growth taking hormones some forms of hormone replacement therapy those that contain estrogen and progesterone taken during menopause can raise risk for breast cancer when taken for more than five years Certain oral contraceptives also have been found to raise breast cancer risk when taken for a long period of time because of its estrogen history. Having the first pregnancy after age 30, not breastfeeding, and never having a full-term pregnancy or nulliparity can raise breast cancer risk because of prolonged estrogen exposure. Drinking alcohol. Studies show that a woman's risk for breast cancer increases with the amount of alcohol consumed over a certain period of time. It is said that 10 grams of ethanol per day puts premenopausal women at 5% risk and 10% risk for postmenopausal women. On survival data, in this graph taken from Schwartz, the survival rate from breast cancer decreases significantly for patients when left untreated. The median survival of breast cancer patients is just 2.7 years from diagnosis. Five-year survival rate was just 18%, while the 10-year survival drops to as low as 3.6% when breast cancer is left untreated. The following data are very important to take note of. 95% of all women who die of breast cancer have distant metastasis. In other words, distant metastasis is the most common cause of death in patients with breast cancer. The size of the primary tumor correlates with the disease-free survival as well as the overall survival. It was found out that when the tumor exceeds 0.5 centimeters in diameter, metastasis is most likely to occur. So therefore, it becomes imperative to catch the disease at an early stage when the treatment can provide the best overall survival. Most important prognostic correlation of disease-free and overall survival is axillary lymph node status. Node negative 
can give us less than 30% risk of recurrence, while node positive will give us 75% risk of recurrence. Promoting survival. This short lecture aims to educate women on this deadly disease and how to prevent and on how to improve and promote survival. Survival rate of breast cancer increases significantly given two factors, early detection and screening. Early detection leads to early diagnosis with subsequent timely and appropriate treatment, which almost always translates to a favorable response. Increased access to to screening services increases breast cancer survival rates of up to 70% in an urban setting. Mammography plays an important armamentarium of doctors to screen patients even before the onset of symptoms. The 10-year survival rate based on New Zealand study is 92% if cancer is detected by mammography and 75% if a lump is discovered by either the doctor or the patient who is brave enough to consult a doctor for the lump in the breast. Which brings us to conclude that early detection is likely to improve the survival of breast cancer patients. Here is the re recommended actions of uh, both PCS and ACS. PCS S stands for the Philippine College of Surgeons and ACS stands for American College of Surgeons. It is recommended for women ages 40 to 44 should have the choice to start annual breast cancer screening with mammograms if they wish to do so. The risk of screening with mammograms as well as the potential benefits should be considered. It can be recommended especially when the quality of life is still good and or the life expectancy is more than 10 years. Women aged 45 to 54 should get mammograms every year. And women aged 55 and older should switch to mammograms every two years or have the choice to continue yearly. All women should be familiar with the known benefits, limitations, potential harms linked to breast cancer screening. They also should know how their breasts normally look and feel and report any breast changes to a healthcare provider as soon as possible. And lastly, my take home messages is for all women to become knowledgeable about their breasts and personal risk for breast cancer, to learn about breast cancer screening through your doctor, and to take action to reduce your risk of breast cancer, and to remember that if found early, most breast cancers are treatable, and that you can survive and still have a good or even better quality of life. Lastly, before we associate the pink ribbon to any political party, we should all remember that historically, the pink ribbon stands for awareness. It stands for the sisterhood that will help women survive and conquer breast cancer. A quote by Evelyn Lauder of the very popular and long-standing cosmetic company, Estee Lauder, who is the creator of the pink ribbon movement popularizes it for the breast cancer awareness champion of the breast cancer research she founded in 1993. She passed away from breast cancer, but her legacy lives on. Thank you. Maraming maraming salamat sa napakaganda at uh, napakalinaw na lecture, uh, Dr. Alonso. And uh, para sa ating mga panauhin ang ngayong umaga at uh, sa ating mga tagapagsubaybay, uh, kung mapapansin nyo, sinagot ni Dr. Alonso ang uh, kung ano ang breast cancer, ano-ano ang uri ng breast cancer at ano ang mga kadahilanan uh, ng uh, pagkakaroon ng breast cancer. Hindi lang yan. Ano po, sinagot din ni Dr. Alonso, ang uh, ipinaliwanag din sa atin ni Dr. Alonso ang mga datos na nagpapahayag kung bakit ang Pilipinas ay nagtataglay ng isa sa pinakamalaking uh, census ng tinatawag na breast cancer sa sa buong Asia no at uh, 
Marami po kong uh, ngayon pa lang po sa unang salvo pa lang ng ating discussions for this morning ay uh, nagsisipasok na po ang mga magagandang tanong ng ating mga tagapagsubaybay and keep them coming. Ano po, idumog niyo po kami ng inyong mga katanungan and we will uh, do our best to answer your questions at the end of the discussion. Just keep them coming. So, maari mang pong hindi namin mapagbigyan lahat ng, uh, ng mga katanungan na inyong iba, ibabahagi sa amin, pero we will try our best to choose the questions which would answer the questions which you may want to ask. Okay, so uh, atin pong uh, tayo ay magtutuloy sa ating discussion for this morning and uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker for today. May we have her credentials, please? Ang ating pong second speaker ay uh, gumraduate sa University of Santo Tomas, sa UST, from the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. And uh, siya po ay nag-training sa general surgery sa ospital ng Maynila. Uh, siya rin po ay nag-fellowship ng minimal access or minimally invasive surgery sa Asian Hospital. She is affiliated with our hospital, the Medical City South Luzon, Asian Hospital, Uh, the South City Hospital and Medical Center and the Kalamba Medical Center. So for us to discuss this morning, uh, hinggil sa screening at diagnosis ng breast cancer, uh, let's uh, welcome, let's all welcome Dr. Judy Cariza Atazan. Judy, take it away. Good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Judy Cariza Atazan and I'm here to talk about screening and diagnosing breast cancer. Let's start off with the definition of terms. Screening is a term used for asymptomatic patients or those patients who, do, who doesn't have any palpable mass, there's no nipple discharge, no skin changes, or no axillary mass. Thus, the term screening mammogram. The term diagnostic, on the other hand, is a term used for symptomatic patients or those patients who comes to the clinic with a palpable breast mass, a nipple discharge, skin changes, or an axillary mass. That's the term diagnostic mammogram. There are three components to screening and diagnosing breast cancer. First, the self and clinical breast examination, then the imaging studies, and the biopsy. Self-breast examination should be done by women in their 20s for early detection, and also to familiarize themselves with their own breasts, also known as breast self-awareness, so that, so that they may know the normal appearance of their breasts, and the normal feel. This is so that the patients may be able to easily identify the new ap appearance of a breast lump, skin changes such as redness or thickening, and nipple discharge. Thus, be able to seek early consultation with their healthcare providers. So what are the things that you should look for during self-breast examination? First, notice any change in size or shape of your breasts. Second, notice any skin changes such as purely orange or a condition in which the skin of the breast appears like the skin of an orange. Third, notice any changes in the nipple or are areola such as nipple inversion or nipple discharge. Lastly, check for any breast or axillary mass. Self-breast examination should be done during day 7 to day 10 of the menstrual cycle while having a bath or while lying down. This may be done using the directions of these arrows as guides, from up to down and going up again, or from outer part going to in, inner part of the breast, or doing circular strokes over the breast, ensuring that all areas are covered. It is also important to note that the, that the axilla part should also be palpated for any presence of mass or lymph nodes. In contrast to self-breast examination, Clinical breast examination is performed by a trained healthcare provider to check for any abnormality in the breasts. This is done every one to three years, beginning at the age of 25 years old. Then we go to the imaging studies. Screening mammogram should be done for 40 years old and above and should be done annually thereafter plus clinical breast examination. So what do doctors look for in a mammogram? Doctors look for any mass, noting its shape, margin, orientation, and density. We look for presence of calcifications, which may be benign or suspicious for malignancy. We look for architectural distortion along with clinically associated features, such as skin retraction, nipple retraction, or skin thickening. Lastly, the location of the lesion is important in the mammogram result. Its laterality, 
quadrant depth and distance from the nipple. The next imaging is the breast ultrasound. This uses high frequency sound waves to generate images without the use of ionizing radiation. This is indicated for younger patients, those who are less than 30 years old with palpable findings, as well as for pregnant or lactating patients. And this is also used as supplemental screening in women at high risk for breast cancer. When is the best time to do a breast ultrasound? For women with regular monthly period, day seven to 10 of the menstrual cycle, for those who are irregular or already on menopause, any day would do. Summarize the findings in breast imaging. We have the BIRADS categories or the breast imaging reporting and database systems for. You would usually find the BIRADS category at the end of each mammogram or breast ultrasound result. Category zero means it needs additional imaging. For example, if you have a mammogram done and the result is BIRADS zero, you will, be, you will need to have a breast ultrasound done. This happens usually because of the density of the breasts. Category one means negative or no abnormal findings. Category two means the lesion found is benign, for example, a cyst. Category three means probably benign, the risk of malignancy being less than or equal to 2%. Category four is divided into three. 4A is low suspicion for malignancy. The risk of cancer is around two to 10%. 4B is moderate suspicion for malignancy. The risk of cancer is more than 10 to 50%. 4C is high suspicion. The risk of cancer being 50 to less than 95%. Category 5 is highly suggestive of malignancy. Risk of cancer is more than 95%. While category 6 is already proven malignancy. Breast MRI, on the other hand, is recommended for screening women who are especially high risk for developing breast cancer. This is in addition to having a mammogram. This is also recommended for patients who have undergone breast augmentation with the presence of silicone implants, saline implants, or silicone injections. This is also recommended for women with inconclusive findings on mammogram and ultrasound. After imaging studies, we have the biopsy. So there are different methods of obtaining a biopsy. First is the fine needle aspiration biopsy or what we call the FNAB, the core needle biopsy, the open or surgical biopsy divided into incision and excision biopsy. Fine needle aspiration biopsy uses a syringe to aspirate some contents or cell sample from the breast mass as shown here. The aspirate is then placed or smeared on a glass slide and is then submitted to the laboratory. Core needle biopsy, on the other hand, uses a core gun. This is to acquire tissue sample from the breast mass. It has a large core needle and penetrates deeper than that of a syringe used in FNAB. This is the preferred method of biopsy than FNAB. Open biopsy is divided into two. It's either incision or excision biopsy. Incision biopsy is obtaining just a slice or a small part of the mass while excision biopsy is removing the whole mass and submitting this to the laboratory. Note that each of these methods of obtaining a sample of the mass has its own indications specifically tailored for each patient. In summary, self-breast examination is recommended for women in their 20s. This is for early detection of any abnormality and to familiarize themselves into the normal appearance and feel of their own breasts. Clinical breast examination is recommended for women more than or equal to 25 years old done every one to three years. There are several imaging studies for the breast. Screening mammogram is recommended for women more than 40 years old to be done annually together with clinical breast examination. Breast ultrasound is another imaging study utilized mostly for younger patients with dense breasts and for pregnant or lactating mothers. Breast MRI is reserved for those patients with increased risk of having breast cancer and is also used to monitor patients' response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Upon identification of an abnormal lesion warranting biopsy, we have several options. Fine needle aspiration biopsy, core needle biopsy, and open biopsy, either incision or excision, each of which has their own indications tailored fit for every patient. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Yan, maraming salamat uh, Dr. Atasan at uh, 
Kung inyo pong nalatandaan, ang tinalakay po ni Dr. Atasan ay ang kahalagahan ng screening at saka diagnosis. At ang kanyang parting message sa atin ay mahalaga ang self-breast examination, ang imaging sa pamamagitan ng mammography, ultrasonography at MRI, at kung kailangan humantong sa biopsy, tatlo pong klase. Yung tinatawag po nating fine needle, core needle, at saka open biopsy. Gaya nga po ng aking sinabi kanina, uh, after two lectures at uh, binanggit din po ng ating uh, pinakamamahal na chair na si Dr. Salvador, that after two lectures, akin pong ibabalik ang floor sa ating mga co-hosts para meron po tayong uh, short program or short quiz. So at this time, I'd like to turn over the floor to our chair and uh, to our head of marketing, uh, Dr. Norgi Salvador and uh, Ma'am Rio Lomarca. Sir, Ma'am? Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Sir. Hi. Ma'am Rio. Ako. Dok, dalawang topic pa lang ha, napapa I'm sure makaka-relate yung mga televiewers natin ngayon, yung nasa Zoom at saka yung nasa FB. Which by the way, Zoom attendees 91 and we have uh, 19 attendees sa Facebook page. So uh, we encourage everyone sa Facebook, share nyo yan kasi this is something na makakatulong sa mga kaibigan, mga uh, kamag-anak natin. Diba? So, do parang, alam mo yung parang siguro nakaka-relate yung iba. Medyo napapakapa sila sa dibdib nila habang na nun, napapakinggan nila, napapanood nila yung presentation ni Doktora Alonso at saka ni Doktora so, so, talagang wow. Na, ang, dalawa pa lang yan, Dok. Dalawa so, pa lang. Ano na next natin, ma'am? Oh. Um, um, Siyempre, dahil extra generous tayo, ah, uh, mamimigay tayo ng uh, TMCSL merchandise ulit. Pero, announce po muna natin yung we will be giving away uh, four uh, TMCSL merchandise dito sa FB, yung ating mga early birds, and one sa, sa uh, so, sorry, four sa Zoom. So, apat sa apat. early birds, yes. Generous nga tayo kasi anniversary ng Medical City South. So, so, yes. Tsaka, isa sa FB, yun yung unang nag-comment doon sa FB live natin. Pero sa Zoom, Doc, yung four na early birds natin is si Miss Mariela Aradasa and Miss Elvira Peleco and syempre yung uh, si Mr. and Mrs. Cayetano, si Miss Aileen at saka si Sir Mark Cayetano. Congrats. Congrats. Claim po ninyo yung inyong prices sa uh, office ng marketing sa ground floor ng Medical City South Luzon. Starting on Monday, pwede na kayong mag-claim. And yung unang nag-comment sa ating FB, actually very familiar na yung yung name ni Ma'am eh, kasi parang so okay na to ng mga webinar ng Medical City South Luzon. Si Ma'am Au Villanueva. Ayan. Hey, congratulations. Congrats po. Okay. So, mamimigay pa tayo do. Mamimigay pa tayo ng mga okay. uh, prizes. So, it's time for the quiz. Quiz na quiz. Ah, may quiz. Ayan. Yes. <laughs> Akala, parang ano, di ba? Parang sasagot lang ng module. Parang ano, online anak. class lang. <laughs> Kaya dapat talaga, they nagtitake down sila ng notes. So, yon For the Zoom. Zoom attendees, we have one question. Okay. Uh, Paki-flash pa, yung question. Sir Kerbin? Ayan. For okay. Zoom attendees, okay, uh, one winner will get, yung makakakuha ng first, makakapag-type ng first correct answer. Hintayin nyo yung sabihin kong go ha, bago kayo mag-comment ng answer. Uh, so, question. Pa, answer na ngayon, wala na. <laughs> wala pa, dapat wag muna. Wag excited masyado yan eh. Basahin. Okay, first question. What are the possible symptoms of breast cancer? A. Lump in the breast. B. Orange-like dimpling of breast skin. C. Nipple discharge. Or D. All of the above. Okay. Sino? Sino? Ma oh, wala pang go. Sino? Wala pang go. <laughs> go! Oh, 
Okay, later. Ayan, so kadami. So, alagang ano sila, attentive sila. So, later yeah. i-announce namin kung sino yung nanalo. Uh, meron tayong DTI representative. Yes, may DTI representative. Siyempre, di ba? High tech tayo, Doke. Okay. <laughs> sa FB naman. FB, sa FB okay. naman po. Sa FB. Different questions. Yes, different questions naman sa FB. For FB. Okay, flash po. Yes. Yon. Yon. Okay, again ha. Wait. Sabihin tayo nyo na sabihin ko yung go ha. Uh, screening mammogram should start at what age and how frequent? A. 20 years old. Then every 3 years. B. 30 years old. Then every 2 years. Or C. 40 years old. Then annually or every year. Or D. 50 years old. Then every 6 months. Go! Parang mas mahirap yata yung FB Live. <laughs> Yan. Pero dapat so, natin matandaan lahat yan. Oo, Doc. Sir. Yes. Doc, ang sagot doon sa number one question natin is letter all D. All of the above. Yes. yes, all of the above. Dito sa number two, ang sagot is letter C. Letter C. 40 years old, then annually. Naku, kang gabi na talaga ako. Ano ni Doktora. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, moving on, meron pa tayong another three topics. Okay, let's go back to, we'll, we'll announce the uh, winner later, dun sa after, after two lectures yes, left. So, for now on, uh, go back, let's go back to Dr. Manlapas. Maraming salamat, Mr. Chairman, at uh, tayo po uh, magbabalik sa ating uh, series of discussions for this morning. And uh, allow me to introduce our next uh, expert uh, from the panel. May we have the, uh, uh, the slide that uh, lists down her credentials. Ang ating pong susunod na dalubhasa ay uh, gumaduate po sa University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Medical Memorial Center uh, or UERM at siya po ay uh, nag, uh, nagtapos ng uh, general surgery sa Philippine General Hospital at natapos din niya po ang kanyang fellowship sa breast surgery sa the medical city sa Ortigas. Siya po ay isang fellow ng uh, Philippine College of Surgeons at uh, ng uh, Philippine Society of General Surgeons. At siya po ang executive uh, secretary ng uh, uh, Department of Surgery uh, sa, uh, hindi ko mabasa itong ano, uh, uh, Siya po ang exe yes, sa, sa executive secretary ng uh, Department of Surgery sa Asian Hospital at training, uh, training officer ng hospital ng Muntinlup pa sa Alabang. Uh, siya po ay member ng PMA at uh, sa Cavite, Cavite chapter po ng PMA siya uh, naka-register. Naka, naka ang kanya pong hospital affiliations are uh, Asian Hospital and Medical Center, ang hospital ng Muntinlupa sa Unihealth Paranaque, sa Southeast Asian Medical Center at of course sa the Medical City South Luzon. Uh, ngayon po ay uh, here to talk to us about uh, the surgical management or the surgical treatment of breast cancer. May I introduce to you Dr. Aludi Mejia. Aludi? Good morning. I would like to thank the Department of Surgery of the Medical City South Luzon for giving me this opportunity. Ako po si Dr. Aludi Mejia, isang breast surgeon. It is my pleasure and honor na mabigyan ng pagkakataon na maipaliwanag sa inyo ang mga operasyon tungkol sa breast cancer. So, surgery is still the first line treatment for breast cancer. And sana with this lecture, mabibigyang linaw po ang inyong mga nasa sa isip at mapawi ang takot sa operasyon na makakatulong sa paglaban ninyo sa breast cancer. So, mas to me. Yan ang naririnig natin madalas na sinasabi nating operasyon para sa breast cancer. Pero ano ito? It comes from the Greek word mastos, meaning breast. Ang ibig sabihin lamang nito ay ang mas to me ay isang operasyon para tanggalin ang suso. Pero hindi ibig sabihin basta-basta natin hiwain ang suso. So matagal na yung bukol sa suso ng mga kababaihan. One of the earliest reference was actually nung panahon pa ng mga Egyptian. Kung saan tinatanggal nila at sinusunog ang mga bukol sa suso. Iban dyan, may mga records pa nung ancient Greece 
na kung saan inaakala ng mga pilosopo na ang pagkakaroon ng hukong sa suso ay dahil sa sobrang bile or pait sa katawan na naiipon sa mga kababaihin na hindi na nireregla. So sa pagdaan ng panahon, maraming sinubukan na treatment para sa mga bukong sa suso. Napaka-agresibo pa nga nila noon na gumagamit pa sila ng kung ano-ano instrumento na mabilis na makakapagtanggal ng suso. Habang tumatagal mula sa napaka-agresibong approach, kinalaunan ay mas naging scientifico na ang approach sa mga bukol sa suso. Napansin ng mga bihasang doktor na hindi kinakailangang sirain ang panglabas ng anyo ng katawan para lang matanggal yung bukol sa suso. Narealize nila ng kailangan lang natin tanggalin ay yung laman ng suso at yung mga kulane sa kilikili na kaakibat nito. Hindi na kailangan tanggalin yung mga muscle sa katabi. So nakita natin yung pag-evolve at pagbabago ng pag-opera sa mga bukol sa suso. Mula sa pagtanggal ng basta-basta at pagsunog nito, naging mas modern na yung approach natin. So ngayon, marami ng pag-aaral na ginawa at nag-aaral din yung mga doktor natin kung ano yung pinakamagandang paraan para operahan yung mga bukol sa suso. So pag sinasabi nating operasyon para sa breast cancer, ito yung mga maririnig natin. Yung breast conservation surgery at yung mastectomy tulad na nabanggit ko kanina. So may iba't ibang klase tayo ng mastectomy. Isa-isahin natin ang mga ito para malaman ninyo kung ano yung pagkakaiba nila. So start off muna tayo sa breast conservation surgery. Uh, ito yung maririnig natin na lumpectomy, partial mastectomy. Quadrantectomy. Yan, lahat, lahat yan ay breast conservation surgery. Pero bakit breast conservation yung tawag natin dito? Tulad ng nabanggit kanina, pag mastectomy tatanggalin lahat ng laman ng suso. Pero dito sa breast conservation surgery, tinatry natin isave yung suso ng babae. Meaning yung buko lamang at konting normal na laman sa palibot ito ang tatanggalin natin. So may matitirang suso ang pasyente. Ito ay pinipili ng mga kababaihan na nais i-maintain ng kanilang suso pero matreat pa rin nila yung breast cancer. Pero ang pinakamportante sa breast conservation surgery ay uh, may kaakibat itong radiation therapy. Hindi pwedeng walang radiation therapy pag sumailalim ang isang bae ng breast cancer conservation surgery. Kasi kailangan ito para siguraduhin na ma- hindi manumbalik yung bukol na tinanggal natin. Yung hindi lahat ng babae pwede rin sumailalim ng breast conservation surgery. Pag-uusapan ito ng pasyente at kanyang doktor kasi depende ito sa laki ng suso, sa laki ng bukol, at yung willingness ng pasyente na sumailalim ng radiotherapy araw-araw sa loob ng isang buwan. So, kanina nabanggit na natin yung tinatawag nating mastectomy. Maraming tawag dito. Total mastectomy, simple mastectomy. Ginagawa lamang natin dito ay tinatanggal yung buong suso kasama yung nipple at areola. Yung lam- laman ng suso lamang ang tinatanggal natin dito ha. Na may naiiwan tayong balat at yung muscle sa dibdib. Tapos pag sinabi natin total mastectomy or simple mastectomy, Uh, o modified radical mastectomy, lahat yan, tatanggalin talaga yung suso. At ang kalalabasan na flat talaga yung dibdib. Nagbabago lamang yung pangalan ng operasyon kung may kasamang pagtanggal ng kulani sa kilikili na ipapariwanan kung mamaya. Operasyon para sa breast cancer, kombinasyon siya ng operasyon para sa suso at operasyon para sa kilikili. So, may mga babae na hindi hindi pwedeng sumailalim ng breast conservation surgery pero nais pa rin nila ma-maintain ng kanilang mga suso. Yung isang pwede natin i-offer or maibigay, maipayo sa mga pasyente nito ay yung tinatawag na mastectomy with reconstruction. Ang ginagawa namin mga breast surgeon, tatanggalin namin yung laman ng suso at mag-iiwan mag- na mas maraming balat. Pagkatapos namin gawin ito, papasok ang ating plastic surgeon na magbabalik ng tambok ng suso. Ito ay sa pamamagitan ng sariling laman mula sa pasyente, sa kanyang puson, o kaya sa kanilang tagiliran, o kaya sa pamamagitan ng implant. Mas maipapaliwanag ito mamaya ni Dr. Firmalo, ang ating plastic surgeon dito sa The Medical City, South Puson. So, ang operasyon sa breast cancer, hindi siya dekahon. Ito ay base sa bukol, 
sa stage ng cancer, pati rin sa kagustuhan ng pasyente. So, asam, ang breast cancer treatment, dalawa yung parts niyan. Yung operasyon para sa breast, whether it be mastectomy or breast conservation, at operasyon para sa kilikili, be it uh, sentinel node biopsy at axillary dissection. So, papali- nabaliwanag ko na kanina yung sa mastectomy. So, papasok, pag-uusapan naman natin ngayon yung operasyon sa kilikili. So, nakapaliwanag na kanina nila doktora, yung breast cancer kasi ay nagmumula sa suso. So, nag-start siya sa suso natin. And then, nagsisimula itong kumalat at ang una nitong pupuntahan ay ang sentinel lymph node sa kilikili. Ito yung kauna-unahang hulani na makakakuha ng cancer mula sa suso. Kaya siya tinawag na sentinel. Oras na makarating sa sentinel lymph node yung, yung, yung cancer, mas malaki ang chance na kaabot na rin to sa na natitirang mga kulani sa ating kinikili. Yung prognosis ng pasyente ay makikita natin kasi doon natin malalaman kung may posibilidad ba na ang cancer ay nakakaikot na sa katawan. Pag kunyari na ultrasound yung pasyente na mammogram, walang anything na suspicious na kulani. Sa kulani, tsaka pag in-examine ng doktor yung isang pasyente, walang nakakapangkulani sa kilikili. Uh, kasabay ng operasyon para sa suso, maaaring sumailalim yung pasyente sa tinatawag na sentinel node biopsy. Ginagawa namin mga breast surgeon dito, may ini-inject kami na special tina. Tapos sa pamamagitan nito, natutukoy namin kung ano yung sentinel lymph nodes. Sa kalagitnaan ng operasyon, kukunin namin yung nodes na yan, ipapasuri natin sa pathologist para malaman kung may cancer ba ang nakarating din sa kulani. Kung negative siya, walang nakarating na cancer, hindi na natin kailangan tanggalin natin yung mga natitirang kulani sa kilikili. Pero kung positive, tutuloy natin yung full axillary dissection. Yung full axillary dissection, sinasample natin lahat ng kulani sa kilikili para malaman kung ganong karaming cancer na titira. Yung axillary node dissection na yan, ginagawa natin yan kapag may nakakapang kulani na sa kilikili yung ating doktor at kung may suspicious na kulani na nakita sa mammogram at ultrasound. Kasi yan yung makakapagsabi kung hanggang saan na nakarating yung cancer sa suso. So maraming pasyente ang natatakot pa rin sa operasyon na nakapagpahaba actually ng buhay ng isang pasyente na may breast cancer. Dahil tinatanggal natin yung mismong cancer sa katawan. So mainam na magpatingin agad kayo sa inyong doktor kapag may nakapaka yung buko sa inyong mga suso. Kasi pag mas maaga natin nalaman at matuklasan na ikayo yung may cancer, mas madaming treatment options na may offer kami sa inyo. Mas marami rin chance para malampasan natin ito. Ang doktor ninyo ang magbibigay ng rekomendasyon base sa stage na meron ka, sa klase ng bukol na meron ka, at saka kung ano yung minanais mo. Tapos, from all those options, pwede ka mamili kung anong gusto mong klase ng operasyon. Tandaan natin na napaka-importante yung early detection. Kapag mas, maagan natin matuklasan kung sino ang may breast cancer, mas maagang stage natin makukuha ito. So, mas mataas ang survival natin. And liban pa dyan, mas maraming options na pwede pagpilian ng pasyente pagdating sa operasyon. Hindi naman natin may iwasan kung sino ang magkaka-breast cancer. Kaya mas maiging, uh, mas alisto tayo para makita natin, matuklasan natin agad. So, maraming salamat and thank you for your very kind attention. Sana nabigyang linaw ko ang maraming bagay tungkol sa operasyon sa breast cancer. Tandaan natin na walang ligtas sa breast cancer. Kaya ugaliin natin na kapain ng ating suso kada buwan at magpa-check up sa inyong mga doktor. Early detection saves lives. Maraming salamat po at ingat po kayo palagi. Okay. Uh, maraming maraming salamat, uh, Dr. Mejia. Alam niyo po... Uh... At ang ating, uh, kung mapapansin ninyo, paganda ng paganda ang ating mga discussion ngayong umaga. No? Nabanggit ni Dr. Mejia kangina ang uh, kasaysayan ng uh, pag-oopera o pagtitis-tis sa sakit na breast cancer at kanyang tinalakay yung history at mga klase ng mga karumal-dumal na kasangkapan at gamit na ginagamit ng mga sinaunang panahon sa pag-oopera ng breast cancer. Tinalakay din niya na meron dalawang general classification ang breast cancer, yung tinatawag na breast conservation at saka yung mastectomy. At, uh, at sinabi niya, mahalaga po, no? ang, ang operasyon ay, ng breast cancer ay hindi dikahon 
at nakadepende po sa klase at sa estado or stage ng breast cancer. At uh, higit sa lahat, binanggit ni Dr. Mejia ang kahalagahan ng teknolohiya, yung tinatawag po nating sentinel uh, node biopsy para sa breast cancer na may malaki pong kinalaman sa pagdidesisyon kung anong klase ng operasyon ang pwede nating uh, maibigay at maipabenepisyo sa ating mga pasyente. Very good. No? So ngayon po, tayo naman ay mag, mag, uh, mag-uusap tungkol sa tinatawag na reconstruction. Alam niyo po kasi pag sinabi natin reconstruction para may ginagawa. So hayaan niyo pong ipakilala ko sa inyo ang ating susunod na dalabhasa. No? So our next speaker is a graduate of the UERM or the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center. At siya po ay nagtapos ng kanyang uh, general surgery training in the same institution sa UERM. And uh, natapos po siya ng kanyang uh, pagtitraining sa plastic and reconstructive surgery sa consortium, sa consortium one uh, ng uh, na isa pong accredited na training ng Philippine Association of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgeons. He is a fellow and uh, board of director of the Philippine Association for of Plastic and Reconstructive Constructive Surgeons. He is a diplomate of the Philippine Board of Plastic Surgery. At dito po sa atin sa TMCSL, ano po, siya po ay head ng, uh, ng uh, dalawang uh, section upong, ng plastic and reconstructive surgery at siya rin po ang clinical head ng stoma and complex wound center in our hospital. He's also involved with the uh, Uh, the Surgery Center in Centuria in Quezon City, in UERM, uh, Philippine Band of Mercy Craniofacial Center, and the Z Institute of Plastic Surgery and Dermesthetics. It is my pleasure to introduce to you and to talk about breast reconstruction in breast, can- breast cancer. Allow me to introduce to you Dr. Vicente Firmalo. Vice, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Vicente Firmalo. My patients call me Dr. Vice. I'm here to talk about post-mastectomy reconstruction. So, what is reconstruction? Well, reconstruction is an attempt by the surgeon to make the operated breast approach a more cosmetically pleasing appearance or, at the very least, become covered for the chest surgeries, which have lost too much tissue. So, most of the time, this is done through a tissue flap. Uh, It may be done with an implant or a combination of the two. Now, in some severe cases, uh, a skin graft is done to cover the chest or the breast defect. So I prefer to think of it um, like a missing piece of a puzzle after mastectomy. The missing piece or reconstruction is unique for each patient. Now, just let me uh, uh, show you that uh, there was the first record recorded breast reconstruction was back in 1895 by Vincent Cerny, a professor of surgery at Heidelberg. So he's generally credited with the first autogenous breast reconstruction. So in 1895, he published a mastectomy case for a benign disease that was reconstructed using a transplanted uh, fist size of uh, lipoma or fat from the patient's flank or the lower back. So how does the tissue look uh, after mastectomy? So the smiley faces here represent the defect or the amount of tissue which is lost during a mastectomy. No? So this is for a cancer which has become very big. So typically, the starting point in reconstruction is a patient who has had a mastectomy for cancer or phyllodes tumor or even breast trauma. If the tissues after mastectomy are enough, then we can do immediate reconstruction. Otherwise, if we need more tissues, we can place a skin graft Or uh, if, for example, we have uh, enough options, then we can actually create more tissue from a tissue expander. No? So it's just like a balloon under the skin and being expanded to create more tissue. So expansion is akin to pregnancy where the belly is gradually increasing in size. The skin stretches along with the increase in size from the inside. Now, how long does breast reconstruction take? Well, it, uh, it varies from... Uh, Um, option to option, it can range from between one hour to as long as maybe six to eight hours. So it depends on uh, the type of reconstruction. Usually, it may take uh, several stages and may take months to even years to complete the final result, depending on the needs of the patient. Some patients are just happy with one surgery. 
No? But others may need more than one. Each person is different in terms of circumstance as well as preference. For this particular patient, she had a lot of skin left after mastectomy. So I immediately placed a silicone implant. Um, since the implant is a foreign body, the capsule forms around the implant. Okay, And different types of uh, uh, capsules form for the implants. No? Some patients may have thinner capsules, some patients may have thicker capsules. So this is one of the reasons why maybe we need to change um, things during the surgery or even after the surgery. No? So the implant typically reconstructs the breast mound or the fullness of the breast. In this instance, mastectomy and reconstruction was done at the same time. So that even in a brassiere, there is still some semblance of normalcy. No? So advantage of this technique is it's very straightforward. It consumes less time. Uh, however, the disadvantage is, of course, the implant is a foreign body. And that capsule reaction or a capsule formation uh, cannot be predicted. Now, how does the breast look like with an implant? So looking at this picture, imagine the side view of a person. No? On the left side of the picture, of the slide rather, there's the skin, muscle, and then ribs. And under the ribs is the lung. Now on the right side, you notice that under the skin okay, and the muscle, there is an implant. So note the absence of the breast mount in the left side and the presence of a breast mount on the right side. This implant reconstructs the breast mount so that there is still a prominence. No? So when you wear the brush here, there's still some uh, prominence left afterwards. Now, this is an example of immediate reconstruction or reconstruction during the same procedure as uh, during the same setting of the procedure after mastectomy. But this uses an expander. This is the expander with uh, what we call a port. No? So that's where the saline is filled inside. So the expanders gradually increase in size until the point that the desired volume is achieved. After you achieve the desired volume, we expand a little more no? so that uh, we make room for skin contraction after the removal of the expander and placement of the permanent implant. Now, the other side was balanced. So if you look at the right side of the picture, so these are the um, different stages during the tissue expander. We put the tissue expander in the flat chest here, and eventually you expand it to create a bigger breast mound. Eventually, the permanent implants, which are shown here at the bottom, are samples of the permanent implants. They are placed. And for this particular patient, the left side is bigger than uh, the left implant is bigger than the right implant. So the right side of the breast, the right breast, had a smaller implant placed during the surgery. Now, the advantage of this type of procedure is that uh, the operating time is not that significant. No, uh, You don't spend too much time in the operating room. However, of course, the disadvantage will include frequent visits to the clinic. You have to go every now and then to have your expander filled up and expanded no? uh, to the desired size. And of course, this is still foreign body. Now, another option is, is if you require more bulk or if you have a lot more skin uh, which has been removed during mastectomy. The latissimus dorsi flap, as an example of a flap, um, we call this a tissue flap, so that uh, there is coverage of the skin and it's a little bit more bulky, so it's not very, very thin. Now, the latissimus dorsi flap, flap, the advantage of which is it's from your own body. So it can never be rejected or it can never react with your own body. Now, sometimes the latissimus dorsi flap is combined with a breast implant underneath. So it will depend on patient preference as well as uh, if the patient is a suitable candidate. No? Um, the advantage of this is it's your own tissue, but the disadvantage of which is it creates more operative time. So you have to have more time for the operation at the same time, the back, where, which is where we're getting the flap from, uh, will also have a, what we call a donor site morbidity. You know? It means that you will also have a scar there and uh, some associated changes in that area as well. So you consult your doctor about this. Now, this is an example of a latissimus dorsi flap with an implant. Of course, the nipple has been reconstructed already. Okay. Now, another type of tissue flap is the tram flap, which is a transversus rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. Uh, 
So this is part of the what we call the six pack. No? When you look at your belly, there are uh, three muscles no? uh, which are evident um, in the skin. No? Uh, half of that, half of the six pack becomes the flap in this case. Now, if you look here, the circular or the oblong thing here is where we get the flap from, the belly. And we put it to the breast here. Um, so this is sort of like uh, a two uh, two-step procedure. First is the getting of the flap from the belly, and then the next is insetting or putting it on the breast tissue. Now, the advantage of which is it's also from your own body, so there's no chance of projection. Now, another advantage is this is also an abdominoplasty. It combines an abdominoplasty procedure, which means that you have an added benefit of a tummy tuck during this same uh, surgery. So your belly becomes um, smaller. But the disadvantage is operative time. So you will require uh, an operation which is a very lengthy procedure for this one. No? And another disadvantage is, of course, half of your um, belly muscle here will be removed and placed in the breast area. So there may be some donor site morbidity or some changes which can occur uh, after this procedure in the belly. Now, this is an example of a tram flap. If you notice in the belly, uh, there's a long incision there, so it's like a tummy tuck already, and then that part is placed here in the breast to put more volume and more bulk. So this can also be uh, combined with or without an implant, but it's usually typically done by itself. Now, this is an example of uh, another type of option for breast reconstruction, a microvascular free flap. So we can get uh, from the donor site here in the belly, and then we connect the vessels, no? the artery and the veins, we connect it to each other in the recipient site, which is the breast. No? When you do the mastectomy, you have some vessels here inside that you connect it to. So that's the reason why it's called the microvascular free flap. Now, the advantage of which is you don't have to worry about the blood supply because you yourself have connected the blood supply. But the disadvantage is uh, operative time as well. It takes a longer time as well as uh, you need highly specialized equipment as well as training for this type of option. Now, after we reconstruct the breast mound, there are different techniques that can be used for nipple areola reconstruction. Well, of course, you have a breast mound, but you don't have a nipple and areola. So we can reconstruct the nipple areola for uh, the breast as well. No? Other options may include cartilage, which can add for the projection of the nipple. No? Um, but it can be as simple as putting an areolar tattoo. No? So you can actually just tattoo the areola and reconstruct the nipple. So those are options which are available. Uh, be sure to consult your surgeon about it. Now, newer techniques can also be done for refinement as well as reconstruction of the breast. Uh, these are what we call fat grafting techniques. No? We get fat from other parts of your body, uh, refine it, and put it in the breast no? for a more desirable breast mount. So these are the options which are available for breast reconstruction. Now, to conclude, I would just like to emphasize that the goal of breast reconstruction is obviously not to restore the function of the breast. Rather, the point of breast reconstruction is to make the patient cool again. The point of breast reconstruction is to make the patient more comfortable by not having a big opening or a big wound at the center of the chest or in the breast. No? So it is also my purpose to inform the audience that breast reconstruction can be done immediately or in a delayed fashion in a separate operation after mastectomy. It is also my purpose to inform the audience that breast reconstruction is covered in HMO and field health benefits. It is also my purpose to inform the audience that it can be done. So ask your surgeon about reconstruction it may be the piece of puzzle that you have been looking for. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Maraming salamat, Dr. Vice. At uh, alam niyo po, napakaganda po ng ating uh, mga napag-usapan ngayon. Ano? Uh, it's about uh, the reconstructive phase. Ano na nangyari pagkatapos ma-diagnose? Ano, anong na nangyari pagkatapos ma-screen? Ano na nangyari pagkatapos ma-operahan? At ano ang mga uri ng uh, reconstruction upang, kagaya nga po na sinabi ni Dr. Dr. Fermalo, now, the purpose of reconstruction is not to restore the function, but to restore the form or the wholeness of the, the, the female body. So, 
Uh, binanggit din po ni uh, Dr. Fermalo that uh, ang reconstruction can either be uh, tissue closure, yun pong uh, pagsasara ng sugat na sanhin ng uh, uh, breast cancer surgery, yung pong paglalagay ng uh, uh, tissue expander aided uh, 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 implants, at saka yung pong tinatawag na paggawa ng mga flaps. Yung pong flaps kasi yun po yung sinabi niya, na yung mga tissue sa ibat, ibang parte ng ating sariling katawan, yun po ay ililipat lamang o itatransfer dun sa defect na naging cause ng breast cancer surgery. So very good. Ano po? So at this point, uh, akin naman po, ako na naman po ay aking ibabalik for another um, a quiz and for another fun time uh, with our uh, audiences and for uh, with our listeners. And uh, this will be facilitated kasi just hold on, don't... Uh, Don't change that channel and I will give to you back our uh, beloved chairman, Dr. Norge Salvador and Ma'am Lirio for another quiz so that you, the audience, will win another uh, set of prizes. Norge and uh, Lirio. Hi, thank, thank you, Dr. Oh, nalaman natin. So, pagkatapos ng best surgery, pwede palang ibalik yung form. No? Oo, so, Dok. Dati kasi hindi na, hindi na bibigay na option yan eh, sa mga patients. Pwede kaya din, Dok, i-donate yung bill-bill. Sorry. <laughs> ano diba? Ito, ako na nakakabuyan ko na yan. Mamaya yung itatanong ko kay Dok Vice, eh. baka pwede may ngailangan siya ng mga mag-donate. So, mag-donate talaga ako. <laughs> hey, may may uh, announce po kayo na no, winner? Yes, Dok. Ito po, yung winner natin kanina sa quiz number one and sa quiz number two. Yung winner natin sa quiz number one from Zoom, si Miss Clarissa De La Cruz. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you may claim your prize mo sa TMC South Luzon sa marketing office. And yung winner natin sa FB, sa quiz number two, is si Miss Caroline Reyes. Yan. Thank you. Thank you po. Yes, Doc. Okay, so next quiz. Next set of quiz. Yeah. Pag-plus po yung question. So question number three para sa mga Zoomers. I like, sorry. FB Live attendees pala. Para sa mga FB Live attendees. Again, wait for the go before answering. Okay? True or false? Radiation therapy is mandatory. Man, ibig sabihin, kailangan na kailangan after breast conservation surgery. True or false? Go! Dok, Dok yung kukunin natin dito yung, hasag- yung panglima. Answer. Uh, Oo, pang- yung panglima na sasagot. Okay, sa so FB Live muna to ha. Hindi pa Zoomers. Yes. Okay, meron na ba tayo? So the correct answer for this is true. no Sa mga breast conservation surgery, kasi nga yung bukol lang tsaka konting laman na nakapaligid sa bukol lang tatanggalin, kailangan na kailangan ang radiation therapy pagkatapos yes. ng surgery. Mamaya po natin i-announce yung winner sa sa FB. Apo. Okay, number four. Ah, uh, Zoomers, para sa Zoomers naman. Again, we are looking for the fifth correct answer. Wait for the go. Okay, again, true or false? Given the right circumstance, The breast may be reconstructed immediately after mastectomy or your surgery or removal of the breast. Given the right circumstance, the breast may be reconstructed immediately after mastectomy. True or false? Go. Oh, fifth answer. No, the bilis. answer for this, so bilis ah. Ako <laughs> oh, nga, Dok. So, i-announce din natin later kasi bilang ang bilis nila lahat sumagot, di ba? Yes, ako. Okay. May ano tayo, may main computer na nag-check kung sino talaga yung ano. Isa lang yung tumitingin kung sino talaga yung winner. Yes. Uh, the answer for this is true. No? So, pwedeng immediately yung reconstruction given the right circumstance. So, it will be discussed by the Sir John, dun sa uh, ating patient. Okay. okay. So, balik tayo sa ating discussion. So, we have two more left. No? Uh, okay, Dr. Manlapa, sir, pwede na po ulit kayo pumasok. Balik po tayo ulit sa ating lecture part.
Maraming salamat, Mr. Chairman. At uh, tayo pong ituloy natin ang uh, next uh, set of discussions natin. Alam niyo po, sa, pag, uh, sa treatment po ng... Uh, sa treatment po ng breast cancer, isa po sa mga pinakamahalagang ma- ma- kaakibat ng, uh, ng mga sirohano ay ang tinatawag nating medical oncologists because they are the ones who make sure that uh, k- kompleto po yung treatment natin sa na ibinibigay sa mga pasyente ng breast cancer. So uh, now, uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce our next speaker if I will be able to find the PowerPoint that will highlight his credentials. Ang acting pong uh, speaker ay again no graduate po ng UERM, a University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Medical Center. Nakakahalata na ako ha, meron yatang UERM mafia rito sa ating uh, uh, mga panelists uh, today. Now he is a graduate of the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center and he has finished his internal medicine residency training at the NK- NKTI, the National Kidney and Transplant In- Institute. Ang kanya pong fellowship sa medical oncology ay nanggaling sa same institution which is the NKTI and is currently practicing uh, medical oncology in various hospitals in Laguna and in Quezon Province. Here to talk about the medical which means the non-surgical management of breast cancer uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce to you our medical oncologist in TNCSL Dr. Nicasio Radova. Nick, take it away please. Good day everyone. And thank you for taking time to listen to our lecture series. I am Dr. Nick Radovan, and I will be sharing with you today some principles on the medical management of breast cancer. Now, since I'm the last speaker in this series, I will make this as short and as sweet as possible. This is the outline of the slides I will be presenting in the next couple of minutes. These are my disclosures. So let's get started. If breast cancer treatment were to be likened to a house, then medical cancer management is one of the important pillars that support it, along with the other pillars of surgical and radiologic management. And everything is grounded on the solid foundation that is a good histopathologic and radiologic diagnosis and analysis. Medical management of breast cancer involves the administration of pharmacologic agents, whether oral, subcutaneous, intramuscular, or intravenous. Its goals include the prevention of recurrence of the disease, the optimization of tumor status prior to surgery, or the palliation of cancer symptoms in cases of metastatic disease. In metastatic breast cancer, the standard of care is usually medical management. But medical management has also been shown to be of significant benefit in the treatment of non-metastatic breast cancers. Most of the evidence from clinical trials shows that not only does medical management have compelling benefit when combined with surgery and radiotherapy in early breast cancer, but also that this benefit is sustained over long periods of time. It is because of this that many consensus groups usually include medical management in breast cancer treatment guidelines. As we mentioned earlier, effective breast cancer management starts with the sound pathologic and radiologic diagnosis and characterization. The pathology and immunochemistry reports help us decide which drug classes can be used in the treatment give us a better idea of the breast cancer stage and therefore which management approaches to prioritize. Let us now take a look at the different classes of drugs involved in the medical management of breast cancer. Cytotoxic agents. Cytotoxic agents are more commonly known as chemotherapy agents. They have been and still are the backbone of breast cancer medical management. They are most commonly administered intravenously, but there are also oral forms of chemotherapy. Good day, everyone, and thank you for taking time to listen to our lecture series. I am Dr. Nick Radovan, and I will be sharing with you today some principles on the medical management of breast cancer. Now, since I'm the last speaker in this series, I will make this as short and as sweet as possible. 
This is the outline of the slides I will be presenting in the next couple of minutes. These are my disclosures. So let's get started. If breast cancer treatment were to be likened to a house, then medical cancer management is one of the important pillars that support it, along with the other pillars of surgical and radiologic management. And everything is grounded on the solid foundation that is a good histopathologic and radiologic diagnosis and analysis. Medical management of breast cancer involves the administration of pharmacologic agents, whether oral, subcutaneous, intramuscular, or intravenous. <clears throat> its goals include the prevention of recurrence of the disease, the optimization of tumor status prior to surgery, or the palliation of cancer symptoms in cases of metastatic disease. In metastatic breast cancer, the standard of care is usually medical management. But medical management has also been shown to be of significant benefit in the treatment of non-metastatic breast cancers. Most of the evidence from clinical trials shows that not only does medical management have compelling benefit when combined with surgery and radiotherapy in early breast cancer, but also that this benefit is sustained over long periods of time. It is because of this that many consensus groups usually include medical management in breast cancer treatment guidelines. As we mentioned earlier, effective breast cancer management starts with the sound histopathologic and radiologic diagnosis and characterization. The pathology and immunochemistry reports help us decide which drug classes can be used in the treatment of a particular breast cancer case. And the imaging studies give us a better idea of the breast cancer stage and therefore which management approaches to prioritize. Let us now take a look at the different classes of drugs involved in the med medical management of breast cancer. Cytotoxic agents. Cytotoxic agents are more commonly known as chemotherapy agents. They have been and still are the backbone of breast cancer medical management. They are most commonly administered intravenously, but there are also oral forms of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is still the most common medical management in our setting in no small part due to its being more financially accessible to the patient. Its adverse effects include nausea and vomiting, hair loss, and bone marrow suppression leading to decreased resistance to infection. Fortunately, new medications and practices have been developed that minimize most of these adverse events. More on these later. Hormonal therapy, particularly tamoxifen, is considered by some to be one of the first forms of medical breast cancer management. They provide breast cancer control in the form of suppression of the female hormone estrogen and its growth promoting effects on the cancer cell. If the breast cancer tumor is found to be overexpressing estrogen receptors on its surface, it is said to be ER positive and is susceptible to hormonal blockade. Again, this is the importance of the immunohistochemical analysis usually requested prior to starting treatment. Hormonal agents have oral, subcutaneous, and intramuscular dosage forms. Its side effects, also due to the blockade of female hormones, are often described as menopausal symptoms, hot flushes, mood swings, alteration in the regularity of the patient's monthly period, if pre previously regular. Molecular targeting agents are a relatively new class of drugs that have revolutionized breast cancer medical treatment since they were first used during the late 1990s and early 2000s. Suddenly, time to decrease progression to disease progression doubled from three to six months and response rates improved from 32 to 49% when combined with standard chemotherapy. Since then, anti-HER2 agents have been used for the treatment of HER2 positive breast cancer. It is therefore important that the ERPR HER2 immunohistochemistry of the breast tumor be done as early as possible 
so it can be known if anti-HER2 therapy is needed to derive the greatest benefit for the patient. Molecular targeting agents have multiple dosage forms. Monoclonal antibody molecules have intravenous and subcutaneous preparations, and kinase inhibitor small molecules are usually administered orally. They have significant and lasting effects in the control of breast cancer, and they have the added bonus of not having the same side effect profile as conventional chemotherapy. So, no vomiting, no nausea, no baldness. They, however, have their own side effect profile, but in general, these adverse events are mild and manageable. Immunotherapy is one of the newest drug classes used in the control of breast cancer. Normally, our immune defenses recognize tumor cells as foreign cells or non-self, but fail to execute immune responses due to interactions with receptor proteins in the tumor that suppress the initiation of said tumor response. These immunotherapy drugs block the suppressive interaction and therefore unleash the patient's immune system. It is currently available in intravenous form. Compared to other agents of breast cancer medical management, immunotherapy drugs have relatively less adverse events and are usually related to overactive or hyperactive immune system. This can include many inflammatory states like thyroiditis, appendicitis, sinusitis, and other itises. And since we are in the Philippine setting where most medical, manage, uh, medical treatment funding comes out of the patient's pocket, it is important to note that the price of these new agents are up there in the six-digit range, given every three weeks. Let that sink in. So let's continue. We have seen the different drug classes in the medical management of breast cancer, and we touched on their respective adverse events. I think one of the greatest strides in the medical management of breast cancer lies not only in the newly developed anti-cancer meds, but also in the newly developed support medications and practices that better control the anticipated side effects of cancer treatment. These are just some of the support medications for breast cancer management. Most of these are given as pre-medications or administered a few minutes before giving the actual chemotherapy. Some of them are also given as a take-home medication after chemotherapy to prevent occurrence of unfavorable symptoms at home. We will now be winding down this talk with some discussions concerning when to best give medical breast cancer management. In non-metastatic breast cancers, medical agents are most commonly given after surgical removal of the breast tumor and after adequate rest and wound healing. Chemotherapy is most commonly given in stage 2 or 3 breast cancers with special considerations in select stage 1 cases that provide optimal benefit for the patient. Hormonal and anti-HER2 therapy are given after surgery and after the results of the ERPR, HER2 immunostains are known. Immunotherapy is usually not given in stage 1 breast cancers, but has recently received FDA indication to be an option in stage 2 and 3 triple negative breast cancers. If you recall from the previous slide, it tabulated that chemotherapy can be given in stage 1 breast cancers in those who have high risk features. These high-risk features are often subject to the interpretation of the medical oncologist based on the description of the pathology report and the history of the patient. If the patient wants a more objective way to decide whether or not to receive adjuvant chemotherapy, then genomic assays are usually recommended for better prediction of the tumor's potential to recur. Genomic assays check for mutations in select breast cancer genes that predispose to increased likelihood of recurrence or more aggressive potential. Based on the results of these assays, the patient can then make a more informed decision whether or not to undergo the chemotherapy. The only downside is that the cost of the test is equivalent or even more expensive than eight complete cycles of chemotherapy 
So in my real life practice, this test is often foregone or refused by the patient. According to the NCCN guidelines, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, there are certain circumstances where in neoadjuvant chemotherapy or giving medical management before doing surgery or radiotherapy confers more benefit for the patient than giving medical management after surgery. Let's look at those points here. If the patient's breast mass is initially inoperable, as in initial diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer or bulky axillary lymph nodes or breast masses with ulcerating wounds, then neoadjuvant therapy will be beneficial to that patient. If the patient's mass is initially operable, but breast conservation is desired and the mass is too big, then neoadjuvant therapy is an option for this patient. If definitive surgery may be delayed for the patient, then neoadjuvant therapy is given as an option. In patients with stage 4 or metastatic breast cancer, the tumors have spread beyond the breast of the patient. And so, surgery and radiotherapy, which are locally directed managements, may be inadequate to address the total tumor burden. Medical management is therefore the mainstay of therapy as it is able to reach all areas of the body that may be affected by the cancer. The primary goals of treatment for stage 4 breast cancer are the prolongation of the patient's lifespan and the optimization of the quality of life. The choice of medical agents, therefore, depends on the patient's performance status as well as the ERPR HER2 status of the tumor and the presence of bone metastasis. So I will present a brief overview of radiotherapy and breast cancer management before ending this talk. Radiotherapy is a highly effective approach to breast cancer management and is one of the pillars supporting treatment of the breast cancer patient. It involves delivery of high doses of radiation to target areas. In non-stage 4 breast cancer, it is done after surgery and chemotherapy, and it has shown to have significant benefit in the prevention of local recurrence of the tumor. In stage 4 breast cancer, it is primarily used for palliative purposes, that is, for symptom control and improvement of the patient's quality of life. If you have more concerns regarding radiotherapy in breast cancer, we will be more than happy to refer you to a radiologic oncologist, a specialist practicing this discipline. So this is my last slide. Thank you all again for giving me the opportunity to discuss with you the medical management of breast cancer. But I would like to just say that if ever you will take anything away from our lecture series today, I hope it will be these two very important points. Please take note of the breast cancer screening guidelines previously discussed in an earlier lecture. Screening really works and it saves lives in actual practice. Patients with breast cancer have the best chance of survival when they are managed by physicians practicing the multidisciplinary team approach. Evidence of the benefits of this approach has already been published. The team usually consists of the attending physician, the pathologist, the radiologist, the surgeon, the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologists, and other specialties like nutrition, psychiatry, and nursing care that cover every base in the effective management of the patient's breast cancer and are in direct communication with each other. Again, thank you very much and have a pleasant day ahead. Yan, maraming salamat uh, Dr. Nick Radovan and uh, maganda po yung uh, natak na natalakay ni Dr. Radovan. Of course, um, mga key points to remember. Na ang, ang medical management po or na, ng breast cancer begins the moment you get your biopsy report. Kung ito mga po ay nagsasaad na merong tayong breast cancer uh, that is a place for the medical management of breast cancer from the very beginning. Nabanggit din po ni Dr. Radovan na may mga, mga pharmacologic agents or drugs that are used in a breast cancer. Uh, yung po yung tinatawag na cytotoxic, hormonal, 
at saka yung molecular targeted medications and yung immuno, immunotherapy plus of course yung supportive medications. Meron na rin pong bahagi ang uh, meron na rin pong malaking kahalagahan ngayon ang teknolohiya in the by way of precision medicine, no? Yung tinatawag pong uh, gene uh, mapping of the tumor that is why we are able to predict the kind of behavior ng ating uh, breast cancer po. At saka po um uh, Uh, yung pong kahalagahan ng tinatawag nating neoadjuvant para neoadjuvant chemotherapy yung pong neoadjuvant chemotherapy para sa mga pasyenteng hindi po maoperahan agad dahil gawang malaking malaki yung bukol na meron silang breast cancer ng sobrang laki na baka maaring hindi maisara sa pamamagitan ng, surg- ng surgery or ma- hindi qualified sa paglalagay ng re- paggawa ng early reconstruction na kagaya na binanggit ni Dr. Fermalo Meron pong role ang medical ang medical management dito. Yun po yung tinatawag na neoadjuvant ter- therapy. At saka yun din po sa stage 4 na breast cancer na po. Yun po ang may role po ang medical management dito at uh, yung pong huling sinabi ni Dr. Aduban, very important. Screening, early detection saves lives and of course, ang management po ng breast cancer is a team approach. Now, ma mga minamahal na tagapagsubaybay, kung mapapansin niyo, kami po ay parang nagkukuwento, no? Paano nang paano ang paano ang uh, breast cancer na 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 na, na diagnose, paano po ito inaassess, paano po ito inooperahan, paano po ito uh, nire-reconstruct at paano po ang at aftercare dito by way of medical management. Ngayon naman po, gusto po nating bigyan ng face yung ating pinag-uusapan ngayong araw na ito. So, alam niyo po kasi mas ma- mas mahalaga kung meron tayong actual na patient or meron tayong actual na person na siyang te-testify or magbabahagi sa atin ng sarili niyang karanasan sa pagkaka-experience niya ng breast cancer. So, I'd like to introduce to you our um, our next uh, speaker who is actually a Can I have the Can I have the Uh, the frame by which I can introduce our our speaker for this morning. Yes, joining us this morning, Doc, is uh, one of the cancer, can, breast cancer survivor, Miss Claire Adeline Martinez Tusaniesa. Good morning, ma'am. Hi, good morning po. Magandang umaga po sa lahat. Thank you po for introducing me. Um, thank you for inviting me po to share my journey with you. Uh, I know it's not yet done, but I'm on my road to recovery. So to everyone, my name is Claire Adeline Pusanyeza. You can call me Tia. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 29. So um, I'll share to you my my journey, my short story. Na sana po ma-inspire po kayo to have yourselves checked and to take care of yourselves. So um, ever since kasi my mom, my grandma, and my great-grandmother Uh, had tumors in their breast. I was really paranoid na po. So ever since nung magkaroon sila ng mga tumor, which uh, luckily naman were benign, uh, I was doing self-breast exams na regularly. So during, after my May period, I do self-breast exams. And uh, last February, my birth month, I had a friend who suggested na we take, uh, we undergo ultrasound, breast ultrasound. Kasi nga, sabi niya, meron daw siyang na-feel na bukol. So, parang sabi niya, friends, I think we should, ano din, lahat kayo dapat magpa-check na rin. Kasi wala namang mawawala if you get yourself checked. So, nagpatas ako, na, kasi I felt a lump sa may left breast ko, near my left nipple, na parang hindi siya nawawala. Unlike yung mga other na parang mass lang na nafe-feel ko or nakakapa. So parang di siya nawawala and medyo parang lumalaki siya or namamaga siya. And yung position po ng lump was uh, near my nipple. So minsan parang um, sayo siya ng buto ng kalamansi hanggang lumaki na siya na um, parang ano na eh, parang naging kalamansi na talaga. So um, hindi ko naman po masyadong tinake seriously at first. Um, mas focus pa rin ako sa career ko and sa job. So ang ginawa ko, I just had an appointment with the breast center in Asia. So they recommended I have breast ultrasound and the mammogram. So lahat po yun, first time ko tinake. Um, wala po akong idea on uh, paano ginagawa yun, ano yun. And then um, they recommended then to ha- to for me to have a biopsy. 
kasi parang madami na daw na lumps sa bre- not just in my breast but sa bandang armpit na sa kilikili na which uh, Ms. Mihi- Dr. Mihia mentioned yun nga yung axillary so sabi ko axillary so yun um during kasi nung time na din doon mga March bawal sa ospital na may companion so talagang I beg the nurses to um, allow me na isama sa na ko lang ang kanina na isama sana yung mom ko kasi parang I had a bad feeling na eh about the diagnosis hindi ko pa alam pero I had a bad feeling na so the nurses allowed me to uh, my, for my mom to accompany me sa ano with the doctor and then sabi ng doctor yun nga uh, I received the saddest news of my life uh, I was diagnosed with stage 3A cancer tapos um, we have to act fast kasi ma para daw mapigilan yung pagkalat ng ng cancer sa ibang parts of my body. So um in a week nagpa swab test mo na syempre of course kasi kailangan po ng uh, sa protocol ng pandemic and then in a week then I had um, my surgery done na. I had mastectomy, uh, reconstructive uh, surgery po tapos um nag-insert din sila ng expander para sa skin. Kasi I'll do chemo and radiation pa. So, hindi pa uh, pwede agad-agad na ilagay po yung um, what men- what they mentioned kanina, di ba? Yung pinapetan either sa sa tummy or um, pwede ding silicone, ganun. So, I had an expander. Nilagyan po nila ako. And then, uh, every month nilalagyan yun ng laman, ng, ng saline. Tapos, um, after that, my um my surgeon then no recommended na I use wigs kasi before my uh, my my ano pangalawang chemo pa lang second chemo uh, I was in the shower tapos biglang uh, nalalaglag isa-isa lang so okay isa-isa pa lang nalalaglag but to my surprise biglang parang lahat na no na naubos parang top of my head talaga na ubos na so uh, um, hindi ako ready kasi I really love my hair. I mean, all, lahat naman ng girls, di ba, yung hair nila is really important to them. So, I was so surprised nung nahulog na lahat. Uh, umiyak na lang ako sa shower. Wala nang nagawa. And then, um, after that, ang nakita po pala nila sa surgery ko was, uh, I had 19 lumps. Tinanggal po lahat ng breast tissue and sa bandang armpit ko nga, I had 19 lumps and 5 of those were cancerous. Tapos, um, I remember in the recovery room then, kasi it was midnight na ata. So, I was trying to process everything. And parang sabi nila na, ang una ko po talagang tinignan is kung nandun pa. Kung nandun pa ba yung left breast ko. And of course, wala, wala na siya. And talagang naiyak na lang po ako. Uh, pero the nurse were uh, very uh, receptive naman. Tapos, they comforted me na in talaga uh, sinamahan nila ako hanggang sa umiyak lang ako tapos everything was new even the JP drains and wala akong idea noon tapos sobrang hassle niya then i even had a barca 1 gene test para po sure na um, yung mga kapatid ko din uh, will be safe from this disease kasi mas maganda na po na um, from the start alam na po namin kung possible sila din magka-cancer. And then, um, within a month, during my recovery, um, as you can see sa screens, yung mga chemo uh, sessions ko po yan. And then, for me po, yung the hardest part was chemo. May mga times na nagwawala talaga ako. And parang nag yung mood. Um, nag-sorry talaga ako after sa mga nurses ko, sa doctors ko, kasi parang hindi mapigilan. Tapos, Yan nga, may pagsusuka. Um, parang yung hindi lang nawala sa akin is uh, yung appetite ko sa food. Pero may mga parang lasa pa rin konti ng metal. And then, um, yun nga, yung hot flashes, totoo po yun, na para ka talagang nagme-menopause. Tapos, um, meron din pong instance na hindi ko matignan yung sarili ko sa salamin. Pero with the emotional support of my family, my friends, talagang, uh, mas gaganahan ka po to fight th- this battle and this this disease. So, sobrang thankful ko din to all of my friends who supported me and who are spreading awareness. Lalo na po itong ginagawa ng uh, the Medical City South Luzon. And um, after po nito, kakatapos ko lang po kasi ng chemotherapy ko two Mondays ago. So, I'll have my radiation therapy by next month. And then, 
another surgery po uh, for the reconstruction of my breast early next year. So um, with everything that happened, uh, what I regret is not taking care of myself the way I deserve. Parang I focus more on my career and my ambitions na I forgot how important our body is. So I hope everyone will get themselves checked uh, as early as now to prevent this this cancer. Yun po. Thank you po for listening. Yun Thank lang. you very much, ma'am. Thank you so much for that uh, very inspiring and very compelling uh, testimony from you. And uh, if there's anything to take home uh, sa at, para sa ating mga tagapagsubaybay, Narinig niyo po yung sinabi ni Ma'am Kia. No? Sabi ni Ma'am Kia, importante na ipasuri natin. Let's take care of our bodies and uh, ating pong suriing maigi ang ating mga katawan. At uh, it, you know, it's a resonating theme throughout the entire series of discussions. Simulat sa pool pa lang. Isa sinasabi nila. From the panel of experts to Ma'am Kia, isa sinasabi nila. Early detection makes a difference. So yun po ang ating... Uh, Uh, a series of uh, discussions uh, this morning. So, ang ating uh, ang ating uh, next uh, ano ngayon will be our question and answer portion. So, akin pong ipakikilala uli ang uh, ating panel ng mga kad- mga dalubhasa ngayong umagang ito and uh, of course, you've heard them all speak uh, and they are authorities in their in their respective fields. So allow me to introduce once again our panelists, uh, Dr. Olive Alonso, uh, Dr. Judy Atasan. Good Dr. morning. Hello, uh, Mejia. Dr. Uh, Vice Firmalo, and of course, Dr. Morning. Dr. Uh, Nick Radovan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And now na kayo nandito na po, kayo po'y pupugin ng mga maraming katanungan <laughs> ating mga tagapagsubaybay ngayong umagang ito. So I'd like to start the ball rolling from a question that was thrown to us by perhaps one of our medical staff. No? So sino man ito na ayaw umamin kasi anonymous kasi it has something to do with the underwire bra. No? So siguro gumagamit ng underwire bra itong staff natin. No? So, so it's, itatanong ko po. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to ask this uh, question, I'll throw this question to Dr. Alonso. Dr. Alonso, Olive. Meron ba yes. Epekto ang, yes, boss. Ang, meron bang epekto ang pagsusuot ng underwire bra? Underwire bra. Sa pag-develop ng ng sanhiba ng breast cancer ang pagsusuot ng underwire bra. A resounding no. No, never naging cause ang uh, underwire wearing underwire bra into developing breast cancer. Uh, actually Uh, these are misconceptions nga and sometimes misinformation given by our you know mga older people uh, including my own relative ano ba <laughs> underwire uh, Olive baka explain niya ano ba underwire bra para sa amin mga hindi nagsusuot ng bra underwire okay hindi ako uh, si, si Dr. Salvador uh, si Dr. Fermalo hindi gumagamit niyan so hindi namin alam <laughs> We also call it wonder bra kasi syempre as you age medyo um you want you, you also want to look good in your ano t-shirt lalo na yung mga tight fitting t-shirts uh, mga tight fitting na uh, dresses so in order for a lady to look good uh yon nagsusuot din kami ng underwire bra so yung bra na yon Uh, usually, padded pa nga. Padded means merong uh, foam na mm. that conforms with the shape of our breast. And then, meron siyang soft wire underneath the, ano, the, the soft uh, cap of the, ano, bra. So, syempre, yun yung nagli-lift, nagli-lift up ng, ano namin, ng Ang breast. Ng ego, para ng, hindi ng, naman ng pang, alam mo na. <laughs> Okay. So gumagaling yeah. hinaharap ng babae. Added confidence, yes, and it brings about uh, you know, uh, a good self-esteem ule bring back the ano, the good old uh, dog so, so to speak <laughs> by ano, by women. So yun yung ano, a resounding no. It, it uh walang textbook uh and, and during our training wala pa kaming na encounter na wearing underwire bra can cause breast cancer. Okay, yun po. So narinig niyo po, ano po? 
Read the lips of Dr. Alonso. Walang kinalaman ang underwear pa sa pagkakaroon or development ng breast cancer. So malinaw po iyon. No? May question naman po ako sa ating uh, pinaka-baby, sa ating mga panelists. Judy. So Dr. Jo Judy Atasan, meron nagtatanong dito from uh, our chief um, uh, laboratory technician, uh, si, si Ma'am Quincy Kiboloy. Tanong ni Ma'am Quincy. So tanong ng medtech ito. No? Is CA15-3 as effective as having a mammography? Judy. So if she's not here, I'll uh, going once, going twice, going thrice. I will give the question to I will give I will throw the question to Dr. Alodi Mejia. Hello, ano ba ang ating uh, masasabi tungkol do sa tinatawag na CA15-3 as against mammography? Una-una sa lahat, ano ba yung CA15-3? Parang test lang siya to detect. Para siyang tumor marker. Pero for breast cancer... Yung ba yung saan nakukuha? Sa dugo ba, sa dugo ba kinukuha yan? Sa swab ba kinukuha yan? O ano, ano ba yan? Ano ba yung CA15-3? Uh, Ito blood test? Blood. <laughs> oh, yan. Okay. Anyway, uh, it's not uh, the recommended screening tool talaga for breast cancer. It's still mammography and breast ultrasound. Uh, kahit man makuha ang ka, tas elevated siya, hindi mo masasabi na ito'y dahil sa breast cancer. So maaring ito'y dahil sa ibang bagay. So okay. usually, ginagamit na to as a tool for doctors to monitor, but not really as a screening. So narinig niyo po yan, Ma'am Ma Quincy. So kung ipinaplano mong i-market yung CA15-3, <laughs> As a substitute sa mammography, kayo na po ni Sir Edwin Dadula ang mag-away niyan. So narinig niyo po ang kasagutan ng ating panelists that it cannot be a substitute for a mammography in as far as screening is concerned. Agree ka ba doon, Dr. Judy Atazan? Nawala ka kasi kami. Sorry, nawala ako. Yun na nga. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Agree po with uh, Dr. Aldo. It's not recommended to use a screening kasi maraming causes na pwedeng tumaas ang CA-153, not just because of breast cancer. Gaya ng ano? Gaya ng ano? Ano-ano pang mga ibang causes na maaaring makapagawa? Pwede pong mga conditions, uh, pelvic inflammatory conditions, yung mga patients natin na may endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Pwede rin kasing tumaas to sa mga may ibang klase ng cancer, sa lung, sa pancreas. Although mas mataas daw siya, sabi ng mga libro natin, sa breast cancer. But knowing this, na may iba pa palang condition na pwedeng tumaas ang CA-153, so why would we use it to screen for uh, breast cancer? So ayun po, para sa ating mga sa audience natin, um, hindi siya uh, part ng basic armamentarium for knowing uh, if we have uh, breast cancer or not. Okay. So again, no, the, the answers of our experts are clear and unequivocal, which means ang mammogram po is the, the in as far as screen, screening is concerned, mammogram trumps CA15-3. Okay, Ma'am Q? Ma'am Quincy, I hope that answers your question. Now I have a question for our medical oncologist, ang ating batikang makisig na balbasaradong medical oncologist na kasapi natin ngayon, si Dr. Nick Radovan. Nick, may nagtatanong dito. Uh, what are the head-to-head -head data that would allow a comparison between alternative medicine and the chemotherapeutic or the pharmacologic drugs that you have just mentioned? If you were a medical oncologist, because nababasa natin at naririnig natin sa mga kabalitaan ngayon, no? may mga, meron tayong mga ibang colleagues na nag, uh, nag, uh, nag na, mga naging proponent na tinatawag na alternative medicine. If you were to be given a comment as a medical oncologist, ano ba ang datos head-to-head uh, -head sa paggamit ng chemotherapy as against alternative management, forms of management? Morning, Doc. Thank you. And sana medyo malinaw yung, ano, yung dating ko sa inyo ngayon. Uh, regarding the question, sa ngayon po kasi there are no head-to-head -head comparisons between uh, yung alternative medicine and yung conventional treatment. Dahil 
wala pa tayong nakikitang randomized clinical trials concerning alternative medicine. So, sa aking palagay po, that is very important kasi magbibigay ka ng gamot sa patient. Kailangan alam mo yung efficacy niya, kailangan alam mo kung ano yung mga side effect niya para mapaghandaan mo. Kung magbibigay tayo ng uh, gamot or substance na narinig lang natin na okay pero wala tayong hard evidence, hindi natin malalaman kung ano po yung mga maaaring mangyari. Hindi nga po natin actually alam kung gagal, gagana yung gamot. Nick, so, ano ba yung difference sa tinatawag ng testimonial or anecdotal evidence as against hard or empirical evidence? Ano ba yung difference? Oh, oh. Yung ano po kasi, mga testimonials no, as often used in alternative medicine. Mga ano po siya, mga statements na binibigay ng mga ano mga patients na oy gumaling ako very effective ito no so pero mga ano yan mga iisang statement ganyan so mga or dalawa lang sila ganyan as opposed to yung mga empirical evidence na ginagamit for standard therapy na mga kunwari randomized clinical trials yun yun nga lang po yung Uh, tinatanggap natin na solid evidence bago mag-start ng gamot. Kasi ang mga pasyente, mga pasyente na ginaga, tinetestingan ng gamot doon ay nasa more than 500, minsan nga more than 1,000. So makakapuha tayo ng statistical analysis ng effectiveness ba talaga ng gamot kumpara sa paisa-isa. So, So ibig sabihin, yung oh, tinatawag oh. na testimonial evidence is pa isa-isang karanasan ng tao base sa kanilang personal na karanasan whereas yung empirical evidence ay base sa datos at statistics na nahahango sa pagbigay ng isang klasing panggagamot as compared to another. Tama ba? Uh, Correct po. At saka yun nga, yung mga testimonial, hindi natin alam kung yun ba talaga yung nagpagaling sa kanila kasi... May mga naririnig ko akong testimonial nung sinasabi nung kaibigan niya, nag-take siya ng ganitong gamot, hindi na bumalik yung bukol niya. Tapos tinanong ko po, naoperahan na po ba siya? Opo. Nagbigay po ba ng chemo? Opo. Tapos nag-take siya ng hormonal. So, hindi natin alam kung yung gamot, yung surgery ang at chemo yung nagpagaling or yung ano, yung alternative na gamot na tinitake niya. So, walang ano, walang control kumbaga as opposed to yung ano empirical evidence natin nakikita talaga doon na walang ibang uh, binigay na gamot kung hindi yung gamot na yon or walang ibang management na ginawa kundi yung management na yon tapos batay doon malalaman natin kung effective ba talaga siya or hindi very good thank you very much doc nick no thank you uh, thank talagang uh, it's a joy to be moderating itong ating mga panel ng mga dalubhasa ngayon dahil If you notice, the answers are they give are very straightforward and very clear. No po? Po naman po ay magtatanong sa ating batikang uh, plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Vice, may question dito. No? May question. One is a question from our, 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 our lay audience and the other one is a question from one of our doctors, doctor staff. No? Ang tanong ng lay audience, pag-iisahin ko na lang yung tanong. No? Kasi... Ang implant ba na silicone ay safe pag halimbawa ay masyado nang matagal na nasa katawan? That's the first question. And in the in the um, in the question thrown to us by our our medical uh, doctor is this, no? Doon sa mga options na ipinakita mo na wound closure, uh, implant placement and flap uh, flap application. Ano ba doon sa tatlong yon ang pinaka may datos na sinasabing siya ang pinaka safe at saka ang may pinaka best outcome sa sa kanila? Or is it a case to case basis? Ano ba ang masasabi mo? As regards the first question, dating ko, is silicone safe for long term long term stay? And the other one of the three options that you elaborated on very clearly for reconstruction Which one has the best? Uh, which one has the safest outcome and the best outcome, or is it a case-to-case -case basis? Go ahead, Vice. Oh, habang wala pa po si Dr. Vice, I will proceed to another question. Dr. Aalo, may question ako. May question dito sa ano? Ano ba ang datos ng accuracy ng tinatawag nating sentinel lymph node biopsy? At bakit siya mahalaga sa bakit siyang mahalagang uh, uh, 
uh, kaakibat sa pagdidesisyon kung ang isang pasyente ay lalakihan, lalawakan ang operasyon or pwede siyang gumamit ng tinatawag na sinabi mo breast conservation surgery. Doktora Alo. Uh, yung sentinel node biopsy, ginagawa lang natin yan sa mga pasyente na walang suspicious na kulane sa breast ultrasound at mammogram. At saka pag na-examine ng doktor, physical examination, wala rin nakakapa. So, uh, yung ginagawa nito yung sentinel node biopsy, gina- it's only for those patients, ha? hindi lahat ng pasyente. Kapag may nakakapa kasi, most likely kailangan natin isample lahat ng kulane sa kilikili. So, why do we do sentinel lymph node biopsy? Kasi kahit sabihin natin maganda ang operasyon para tugunan natin ang cancer, tanggalin natin yung bukol, meron syempre yung kaakibat din na complications ang surgery. Isa na dito yung tinatawag natin lymphedema. Nangyayari ito kasi syempre, ang ating kulani, hindi yan basta-basta nandyan lang. May purpose kasi yung mga kulani natin. Uh, aside from being parang security guard ng katawan natin, sila yung nag- namamagayan. Pag napansin nyo, pag may sakit tayo, di ba? Kasi napipick up niya yung mga mikrobyo. Siya yung nagsasabi sa ating sistema na, oy teka lang, may kakaiba dito. So in the same manner, yung ating kulani, siya rin yung nagsisignal sa katawan natin na, pag lumalaki siya, uy, teka, may something na nangyayari sa suso natin. Uh-huh. So, pag tinang, yung isa pang ginagawa ng kulani natin, kung meron mang excess na fluid or katas sa ating katawan, binabalik niya ito sa ating dugo, sa circulation. So, pag nag-opera tayo, kailangan kasi nating malaman kung ganong karaming kulani yung naapektuhan ng cancer. Uh-huh. Pero, pag, nangy- pag ginawa natin to tatanggalin natin yung mga kulani sa kilikili. So by doing this, nagka, nawawala yung kulani, yung function ng kulani sa paggather ng katas extra fluid sa katawan natin at balik sa dugo. So yung isang complication ay ang tinatawag ng lymphedema or yung pananatili yung tubig katas sa braso sa same side ng cancer. So, Nagmamanas naman, yung braso. Na, oo. Oh. So pag ganoon, oh, siyempre mabigat. Kung pasyente, debilitating, minsan nagsusugat dahil sa sobrang tubig, hindi nakakabalik sa circulation. Kung kaya nating maiwasan kasi yan with sentinel node biopsy, we can do that. Tapos so, may, mali, mga mali no, din. may mga precautions din. Kung so, sa ilalim ka ng axillary, tatanggalin lahat ng kulani. Hindi ibig sabihin automatic magmamanas yung braso mo. So that's why we always do precautions. Inaalagaan natin yung braso. Sasabihan natin yung pasyente, Huwag ka magpapaturok ng du- magpapakuha ng dugo, turok, bakuna, kahit DP sa arm para protective. At saka sinu- Doon sa arm na may manas. Doon sa, sa arm, arm na, na may manas. Sa arm na pinagtanggalan ng cancer. Kasi iniingatan natin yung arm eh, lalo na pag tinanggal lahat ng kulani. Maraming salamat, Dr. Alot. Napakalino na pal- kapaliwanagan. Ano? So tayo po ay babalik sa so, welcome back, Dr. Vice. No? Dr. Vice, ano po ano po? Na po. Uh, walang ano man, kala ko yung nagtampo ka na sa amin at uh, umalis ka sandali. Merong magandang mga katanong. Nabutan ko lang po sir yung, sil- yung silicon. Mo, no? Yung sa silicon, okay ba Apo. ang silicon na magtagal sa katawan? At ikalawa, ano-ano ang mga ano-ano ang masasabi mo tungkol sa safety at long-term outcome ng tatlong klaseng reconstruction modalities na iyong idiniscuss kanina? Ano sa kanila ang pinaka-the best or is it a case-to-case basis? Go ahead, Dr. Weiss. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my apology is na putol po. Anyway, so with regard to the safety of silicon, no? uh, we need what happens to the silicon when it is in it. Nagkakaroon po tayo ng capsule, no? pinapalibutan ng katawan. Hindi ganun kadami ang reaksyon ng katawan natin sa silicon. Kaya yun yung ginagamit. Nalagay ko sinasabi sa mga pasyente ko, ba't di tayo pwedeng gumamit ng ito? Uh, bakit silicon? Because this is an inert material. Now, with regards to ang um, recommendations po natin is based on scientific data, which is very rare ang magkaroon ng effect ang silicon in our body, which is mostly capsular contracture, meaning to mitigas yung breast Um, to mitigas yung breast or meron din siya mga implant illness na tinatawag, pwede kang magkaroon ng nausea, vomiting, uh, anxiety. No? So th- these are some of the effects 
associated with the implant. Pero, ang tawag po natin sa medicine, eh, there's no causal relationship. Ibig sabihin, sa mga tao na may implant, nakikita ito mga simptomas. Pero, wala pang nakakapagsabi na ito ang nagkakos talaga ng simptomas na yon. Now, with regards to the evidence, ang silicon, konti lang po yung uh, data with regards to the side and na-reconstruct po sila. Now, with regards to the different types of options, uh, it depends. Eh. Number one is selection criteria, meaning sino ba yung mga pasyente na pwedeng magawa ng implant Sinong pasyente pwedeng expander only, expander than implant? Sino mga pasyente na latissimus dorsi? So, ang importante is inclusion. If for example, your uh, hanap buhay mo or your work is you are an athlete or something to do with uh, physical activity, then uh, the muscle implants or the tissue flaps might not be a good option. No? On the other hand, sa mga studies, pinag, pinag-aralan nila kasi yan eh. Yung mga na-reconstruct na halimbawa latissimus dorsi, eh, kailangan mo ang upper body mo, ang our arms mo for the function. Nakita nila, based on uh, surveys with the patients, na some of the patients, they will say, merong problema or nabawasan yung lakas nila or the strength. But when you look at the functional uh, uh, status of the patient, meaning... May mga objective parameters kasi muscle activity, tinitingnan yung electromyography. Ibig sabihin, mga ano po to, um, mga distinct na data, hindi yung sabi-sabi lang. There was not much difference between much difference between uh, patients who had undergone reconstruction and patients uh, who did not undergo reconstruction in terms of uh, quality of life as well. as power doon sa sa kamay. So sabi nila at ah, baka na geography mas tumataas ang readings. So ibig sabihin nagko-compensate ang katawan. So ibig sabihin lumalaki ang muscle kahit nagawa natin yung reconstruction. So the data which is available na nagsasabi na okay, may mga sinasabi na hindi din. So it's up to you to talk to your uh, surgeon about it. You have to uh, tell your doctor, uh, ito yung activity ko, gusto ko pagkatapos, nagagawa ko pa rin ito. No? So these are the things that you should be uh, talking to your surgeon about. So iba-iba. So iba-iba rin kasi ang morbidity. Merong mga uh, pagsugat, mas pangit ang sugat, kalimbawa, mga tissue flap. So kung yun ang concern mo, then you have to explore other avenues or other reconstructive options. If okay sa yung may sugat sa likod or sa, sa tummy, then you can uh, explore the tissue. Okay. So, then, iba-iba rin po. Kaya inano ko kang good kati ka for pila. Okay. Yun po. Thank you. Salamat, Dr. Weiss. No? So, ang, ang sinasabi po sa atin ni Dr. Weiss, silicone is safe. Ang tawag po nila dyan ay inert substance. Ibig sabihin, pwede pong magtagal iyan sa katawan. At ang sinasabi rin po ni Dr. Weiss, when it comes to yung reconstruction uh, modality na kanyang tinaha kanina, it is really a case-to-case basis. It really depends on the patient. So uh, one, one, uh, one form of reconstruction may be advantageous over the other, but it depends on the circumstance by which it will be applied. No? So yun po yung ating, uh, yun po yung ating uh, moral of the story na sinasabi po ni, ni Dr. Firmalo sa ating ngayong umaga. Now, okay. Uh, Dr. Olive, merong, uh, merong isang tanong din dito. No? May isang tanong dito. Bakit daw kaya, bakit daw kaya, uh, ano po, po kaya ang kadahilanan kung bakit ang Pilipinas ay may isa sa pinakamataas na census ng breast cancer sa sa A, sa Asia no? so could you comment on the reasons uh, the, the the demographic the epigenetic or the environmental reasons that we that 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 may be present in our setting and explain kung bakit may kataasan ang census ng breast cancer sa Pinas yes um Thank you for that question. Very interesting and very ano talaga uh, important to know the risk uh, factors of uh, women, no. So sa Pilipinas kasi, no. Um, you know, I can I can I, I have already mentioned several ano risk factors in uh, during my lecture. Number 1, I think 
I think for myself lang, uh, diet is very important. You know, uh, Filipino diet kasi, no? Um, it has been said na we are more westernized than uh, the rest of the Southeast Asian countries. Kasi, you know, ma ma marami sa atin mahilig sa fast food, high fatty uh, diet, yung food choices natin, high in red meat, high in sugar. And so these things, you know, pag-processed yan, and dami-daming ano, mga hormones, growth hormones that is that are being injected on chicken, on cows, on pig. And those are growth hormones. And uh, hindi yan medyo safe because it acts like estrogen. No, It, it, it stimulates uh, 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 cell growth. Uh, and sometimes, of course, nag, nag mutate din sila. So when we say high fatty diet, uh, alam natin na ang estrogen is being, uh, you know, yung estrone is a derivative of estrogen. It, it's, it, it gets stored in the fats, you know, underneath our skin or subcutaneous tissue. And it has been um, uh, uh, said na the more fats you have underneath your skin, the more estrone you have in the body. And you know na the chain reaction, yan na ang simula ng, um, ng influence of estrogen hormone in the breast tissue. Diyan na yung nagsisimula. There's rapid uh, growth of uh, uh, breast cells. And then, andyan na yung ano, chain reaction yan. And number two, uh, I think... Uh, common pa rin to yung mga misconception and misinformation given to us no uh, hindi sila magko-consult agad-agad sa doctor nila eh. uh, mas naniniwala sila sa you know relatives neighbors na ganyan na uh, ayo kung uh, common yung uh, sinasabi nila na uh, which i encounter in the clinics na uh, ayoko magpagamot kasi baka cancer ito. And the more na dapat silang magpagamot. Pero ang sinasabi nila, um, uh, pag ginalaw kasi ang bukol, baka lalong magalit. Lalo Aha. daw, ano, yan, very Ay, common yan na. <laughs> pag ginagalaw daw ang bukol sa breast, uh, lalong nagagalit. So lalong lumalala sila. So, and so for this reason there's there's delay in their ano in their consultation in their talks with their doctors no um tapos uh, yung false notion nila or yung yung fear nila of losing a very vital part of their body very common comment yan in the clinics na ayoko mawawalan ako ng breast Parang love na love nila yung breast nila. So kahit na may bukol na doon, hindi pa rin sila magpapagamot. So there's really delay in the ano, in the detection or in the diagnosis of uh, mga breast diseases. So okay. and number 3, of course, unhealthy lifestyle. Most of us, pre, uh, most of the women are are ano, are working uh even married women working so wala silang time for uh, several activities wala silang time for uh for exercises so, ayun ang mga babaeng smerdyo na nandito ayun ang mga babaeng sinuha na napaka <laughs> napaka dedicated sa kanilang mga trabaho no? yeah so nawawalan sila ng time for themselves para i-examine nila yung sarili nila and nawawalan sila ng time para you know yung mga activities exercises kasi nauuna yung ano yung work and of course syempre you cannot overlook yung pressure and stresses nila sa work nila so with that uh, lagi silang nakatutok sa work nila and um you know inactivity uh, translates to uh, fatty fatty buildup in our ano, in our body and particularly dito sa subcutaneous tissue natin where estrone is stored uh, and estrone is a derivative of estrogen so same lang sila same banana and number four the cost of treatment uh, this is very often that you will encounter in the clinic um, pag na 
na diagnosed na silang may breast cancer or even uh, on on consultation pa lang, di ba? We often encounter na doc magkano ba aabutin ang ano ang ang um, biopsy and then uh, ang ang definitive uh, treatment like uh, surgery medyo ano na uh, overwhelmed no, sila no, yes no, that's the word um overwhelmed na sila sa gastusin and then um parang um parang wala na silang pag-asa right away uh, hindi na sila parang tatanggapin na nila na oh okay lang yan nandiyan lang yan na. anyway na. uh It's been there for three years already, and it's not growing in size. So I might as well observe na lang. Siya na rin na mismo ang nagsasabi na, sige lang, doktora, uh, antayin ko na. <laughs> so yeah, I think those four uh, four reasons I gave are ano, very significant in the increased prevalence of uh, breast cancer in the Philippines. Maraming salamat, Doktora Olive. No, napakaganda ang mga tanong ng uh, ibinabato sa atin ng ating mga panauhi ngayong uh, umagang ito. Pero alam niyo po, gaya na sinabi ko kanina, baka hindi po lahat magpaunlakan ma- pa- natin. So I will just choose a few more questions ano? because uh, uh, we may be running late. And I would like to ask this question to Doktora Judy Atasan. Judy, asan ka? Where are you, Judy? Judy, ano ang iyong maipapayo? Ano ang maipapayo as a screening uh, screening uh, battery para sa isang pasyente na matlakas ang history ng breast cancer sa pamilya? Ang nanay nagkaroon, ang sister nagkaroon, ang lola nagkaroon. Ano ang iyong maipapayo by way of screening sa kanila? Okay. So earlier yung na-discuss ko po uh, na screening um, guidelines natin that is for the average risk na patient. So, ibig sabihin po yung mga pasyente natin na walang kamag-anak na may breast cancer, um, ng, um, late na uh, ng, may anak naman, hindi gumamit ng pills, uh, tama lang din yung, yung age niya na nagka-menopause is average, hindi masyadong late, pati yung unang menses niya, um, hindi naman masyadong maaga. So for those patients o mga pasyente natin na ang daming uh, kamag-anak o mukhang mataas ang risk na magka-breast cancer din, ang unang uh, may sasuggest ko po, syempre kasama pa rin dyan ang self-breast examination. So ayun yung pagkapa natin sa mga sarili nating breast. Unang-una ay para malaman o makabisado natin ang normal na feel ng breast. So tayo yung unang makakaalam kung may bukol, may kakaiba, na wala dyan dati. Uh, sabi nga, early detection is the best cure. So pangalawa, knowing na marami tayong kamag-anak na may breast cancer at ang breast cancer ay namamana o hereditary, uh, mas maganda na magpatingin tayo sa ating healthcare provider para ma-assess uh, properly ang ating risk category at uh, mabigyan tayo ng advice. Usually po, kapag um, higher ang risk natin, hindi natin sinusunod yung sinabi ko kanina na uh, mag, mag-screening mammogram lang tayo kapag 40 years old na. So yung sinabi ko pong 40 years old kanina for the screening mammogram ay para sa mga pasyente po na average risk. So walang kamag-anak na may breast cancer, uh, may mga anak at hindi gumamit ng pills. Pero kung medyo mataas ang risk natin, ang suggestion po dapat um, usually it's about 10 years earlier kang magpapascreen kung ilan taon man yung um, kamag-anak mo na nagka-breast cancer. Kunyari, yung nanay ko po nagka-breast cancer siya ng um, uh, 40 years old siya. So alam ko na high risk ako dahil ang nanay ko may breast cancer, ang breast cancer na mamana. So ang suggestion dapat 10 years earlier dan na diagnose na nanay ko may breast cancer so that's 40 years old siya minus 10 so dapat pagdating ko ng 30 years old nagsi-start na ako uh, magpa-check up sa doktor um, para mabigyan ako ng request for proper imaging the it me but uh, it is usually mammogram plus ultrasound lalo na po for younger patients uh, lalo na ang nakikita nating trend ngayon ay younger patients na may breast mass uh, it's always a combination of ultrasound and mammogram. 
since yung mammogram may mga lesion o mga bukol siya na hindi nakikita, na nakikita naman sa ultrasound. So para silang partner, they go hand in hand. Kung anong hindi nakikita ni mammogram, makikita ni ultrasound. So better po yung sensitivity natin and better yung chances na makatch uh, kung may breast. Maraming maraming salamat. So all but Apo, yeah. But it always starts with self-best examination. So wag tayong matakot na kapain ang mga sariling nating breast. So iba kasi natatakot baka daw may makapang bukol. Eh actually yun ngayon. Sa kapampang, ang kasabihan niya, oh, kapamo. Yun. Dapat ikapamo. So yun ang ano, no? dapat uh, tandaan natin yun, ano? mga kababaihang, mga uh, taga-subaybay sa ating ngayong umagang ito. Now, I'm going to ask the last, uh, I'm going to ask uh, one question to Dr. Aludi. One question to Dr. Vice, one question to Dr. Nick, and one question to Ma'am Kia. So, alo, uh, medyo bibilisan ko lang ng konti kasi we are running, we are running late dahil sa dami ng uh, mga panauhin natin nagbabato uh, ng tanong. Alo, ang babae ba na nag-pa-implant uh, nag, uh, for uh, cosmetic reasons, uh, delikado bang magkaroon ng breast cancer? Ah, uh, yung paglalagay ng implant wala siyang kaugnayan tungkol sa breast mismo ng pasyente. Wala Either nila kaugnayan. Okay. Yes, kasi nandoon pa rin yung laman, yung bedding ng pasyente, yung suso niya. So, ang difference lang is minsan mas mahirap lang i-monitor kasi pag may implant, nag pag inultrasound mas mas hindi siya ganun kakita kung meron mang bukol. So, ang nire-recommend for monitoring for or check-up sa mga pasyente na may implant is usually the MRI. And usually the plastic surgeons like Dr. Firmalo, they also request the MRI to check if there's a possibility of kunya, rupture or butas, pero bihirang-bihira yon. So, yun. Thank you. Walang kaugnayan ang paglalagay ng implant for cosmetic reasons sa tinatawag nating carcinogenesis or pagde-develop ng breast cancer sa suso. So, Vice, may katanungan dito, no? Um, meron meron ang meron tayong isang patient who underwent a mastectomy at napapansin daw niya ay kumakapal ang scar, no? Kumakapal ang scar at kumakapal ng kumakapal at ngayon ay medyo sensitive daw ang pakiramdam. Now, ito bang scar na ito is this something uh, urgent that requires removal? Or is there a need for a biopsy of the scar that uh, um, may uh, be a, uh, an, a, a uh, warning of a recurrence? Ano ba ang kailangan gawin ng isang pasyenteng nagkaroon ng tinatawag natin pangangapal or panlalaki ng scar after a mastectomy? Thank you for this question. Um, ang mga pasyente na nagkaroon ng ganyan na kumakapal at sumasakit, usually these are actually symptoms of uh, hypertrophic scarring or keloidal scarring. But uh, being in the breast, there is always a possibility of a recurrence. So, ibig sabihin, uh, the best would be to, number one, go back to your uh, surgeon, the one who did your mastectomy, so that uh, he or she will be able to see if this is a recurrence or not. Now, if their surgeon has not ruled, uh, has been able to rule out a recurrence, then you can go to a plastic surgeon uh, so that uh, the plastic surgeon can take a look if this is a hypertrophic scar or keloid. Uh, there are some modalities available that can be used to the Uh, decrease the incidences of this pain or this uh, other symptoms that you are uh, experiencing. Very good. No? So, ang payo ni Dr. Bay sa atin ay makatapos suriin ng uh, breast surgeon ang scar for the possibility of recurrence at natuklasan uh, siguro sa pamamagitan ng biopsy na ito naman ay hindi uh, breast recurrence, maari siyang tumungo sa plastic surgeon for treatment of what he calls as hypertrophic scar. No? So, yun po ang ano, very, very, very clear. Kung mapapansin ninyo, itong ating mga panelists are very, very clear with their answers and that just goes to show that they know what they are doing and they know what they're talking about. Dr. Nick, may nagtanong dito. Sa biology ba ng uh, breast cancer, ang isang patient na merong ovarian cancer ay maaari ding magkaroon ng breast cancer 
in her lifetime. Are they related? Thank you for asking that question. Akala ko hindi na matatanong so sinagot ko na yung nagtanong sa akin pero um, yung usually breast cancer isolated case po siya. Parang ano uh, nagkaroon lang talaga. Pero may, usually mga 85% isolated breast cancer. Pero may mga familial forms po or yung mga namamana na, na merong link na sinasabi na pwede rin magkaroon ng ovarian cancer. Kung maalala nyo yung, yung talk po kanina ni Ma'am Kia, nagpa-BRCA testing siya. So yung mutated gene sa BRCA, siya po yung nagkakost ng familial breast cancer, familial ovarian cancer, tapos sa males, mga prostate cancer. So merong link pero hindi po, ano, hindi po siya yung majority ng nangyayari. And okay. yung second question regarding TABSO, yung surgery, Uh, wala naman pong evidence na nagsasuggest na pag naoperahan ka sa matris, eh, tataas yung risk mo na magkaroon ng breast cancer. Pagkos, pag tinanggal nga po yung ovary, yes. mas yes. bababa pa yung risk for breast cancer kasi yung estrogen supply eh, mababawasan din. Very good. Okay, so malinaw po yun. Ano po? So maaring may link ang ovarian cancer but uh, uh, well, uh, it, it is always good to prepare for the possibility And yung as regards yung THBSO, ang, ang ano pa nga yung, yung tabi sa po o yung pagtatanggal ng matris sa tubo o baryo sa mga kababae na nagkaroon tinatawag na hysterectomy, uh, they are even a, a beneficial thing <coughs> in as far as breast cancer is concerned dahil po yung estrogen na source na ang ovario ay bumababa. Now I'd like to ask this final question before we wrap up. I'd like to ask this final question to Ma'am Kia. Ma'am Kaya, sa inyong journey po, may nagtatanong po sa isa sa ating mga panauhin. Kung meron po bang mga support networks kayong maire-recommenda sa mga pasyenteng uh, dumaranas din ng similar journey sa kanilang buhay sa ngayon? Opo. Uh, actually, yung ano uh, regularly po, no, I attend seminars. Um, actually, nandun si Ms. Bebeth Ortez. Uh, minsan din po nagtatalk sila, Ms. Maritoni. So, I suggest po join those forums and seminars. Kasi nakaka-inspire po talaga yung kwento ng survivors and sa kanila po talaga tayo matututo din aside from our doctors and nurses. And of course, I also get emotional support din sa network of doctors and nurses ko kasi sila yung usually ko pong nakakasama during my battles and uh, my tests and my surgery. So yun po, maganda po na mag-reach uh, out tayo kaysa po mag-isa lang po nating tahakin yung journey na to. Ito po bang mga ito ay they broadcast themselves in social media so that our... Uh, <laughs> our uh, audience can actually uh, engage with them and contact them? Yes po. Um, you can go to smo.org.ph. Marami pong uh, mga uh, ina-advertise doon na seminars. Eh, may mga um, learnings din pong matututo yung mga attendees natin from there. Very good. So meron po, ano, may mga network support organizations who vote for, uh, uh, for mental health and uh, other other um, uh, issues that may be associated with uh, breast cancer treatment for our uh, people, our, our countrymen who are experiencing the same. So as we wrap up, I would like to reintroduce again our panel of experts. Now, and I will give them, I will give them 20 seconds to say their final piece. Guys, huh? 20 seconds. So I'd like to begin with Dr. Olive. Then all the way down to uh, Dr. Judy Atasan, Dr. Alo Mejia, Dr. Vice Firmalo, and Dr. Nick Radovan. Dr. Olive, your time starts now. 20 seconds. Final words. Final words. So um, know your breast very well in the same manner that you know your face. So if you love yourself, you love your face, you love equally your breast. So you know, uh, do know your risk. And um, uh, uh, what else? <laughs> um, uh, do a uh, seek consult to your doctor whenever uh, possible to discuss to you the the beauty of a screening for early detection of breast cancer. Very good. Okay, Judy, Dr. Judy Atasan, final words: twenty seconds on screening and diagnosis. Twenty okay, seconds. So okay. Final words po, self-best examination is important, followed by clinical best examination and diagnosis and imaging as well. Yun Very lang. Good. Very good. Dr. Alon, 
on the surgery of breast cancer. 20 seconds. Ang aking mensahe para sa ating mga tagapanood ay ugaliing magkapanang suso kada buwan at mag- magpa-check up kayo agad para matuklasan na natin kapag kung ano yung nararamdaman ninyo. Huwag yung pangunahan ng takot. Kasi nandito po kami para tulungan kayo. Nandito so, kami mas, para tulungan kayo, sabi yes. ni Dr. Alo. Okay. Mas maaga nating matutuklasan yung cancer, mas maaga natin siyang maagapan, matitreat natin, at mas mataas yung cure. Very good. Dr. Vice on the reconstruction of post-mastectomy patients. 20 seconds. As with everyone, early detection saves lives. But if, for example, you are faced with the mastectomy, Reconstruction is also an option. So you do not have to be disfigured for life. You That's do it. not have to be disfigured for life because reconstruction can be done. And it can be done, can it be done in the medical city, South Luzon, Dr. Vice? Yes, it can be done in the medical city. It can city be city. done in the medical city, South Luzon. Dr. Nick Radovan on the medical management of breast cancer, 20 seconds. Uh, three points. So first, sorry kung makulit, pero breast cancer screening. Kahit yun lang yung maalala nyo sa talk na to, okay na po ako. Number two, multidisciplinary team effort. Hindi iisa ang doktor nyo sa breast cancer. Number three, never walang pag-asa kahit ano pang stage ng breast cancer yan. Kaya ang kaya natin yan. Pag-asa. So tandaan nyo po yan. Tulungan ang pagmamanage ng breast cancer, early detection, iisa sinasabi nila, at saka walang pag-asa. And finally, Ma'am Kia, What would you like to say to our to our audience? Ikaw, I will I will give you slack. I will give you 30 seconds. Uh, please get your cell checks as early as now po, please. Punta na po kayo sa breast center, sa nearest hospitals nyo, or sa the medical city, South Luzon. And wag po matakot, wag pong harapin to mag-isa. Meron po tayong pamilya, meron po tayong mga haibigan na open po sila na makinig sa inyo. Dahil lang sakit po na ito, hindi po to pang isang tao lang. Pagpamilya po siya. Salamat right. po sa inyo. Maraming salamat to our panel of experts and to our expert witness who has undergone the journey of this particular condition. So now, na po, alam niyo po, itong ating, uh, uh, itong ating uh, talakayin ngayong umaga, hindi mangyayari if we did not have the benefit of support from our friends from the industry. And I'd like to recognize po at this time to give us a few words. Ilang seconds ba ibibigay ko sa kanila, Ma'am Lirio? So do sa ating mga so so ano so uh, I'd like to recognize our partners and uh, in 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 industry who have supported our undertaking for this morning. First of all, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, our product uh, manager from uh, the Medtronic uh, Medtronic uh, medical uh, medical uh, surgical uh, uh, specialties. Uh, she is uh, Uh, Miss Joanna Paula Tubera and our product manager from Accord who has also graciously supported our activity from this morning Mr uh na, nawala yata ano Mr Tonet uh okay Mr Salvador Borja so ladies first I'd like to ask uh Pau uh Doc Pau Tubera to give us a few words from uh, Medtronic so that our audience will see the face and faces behind the support that you have given us for this morning's activity. Thank you very much, Dr. Manlapas. Good morning, everyone. I'm Paula Tuberap of Medtronic Philippines, and I am the product specialist under stapling access and instrumentation. On behalf of our company, po, I would thank the MC South Luzon for giving us the opportunity to be part of this event, the Breast Cancer Awareness Program. Po. It's our pleasure to be part of the sponsors. So let's watch this video which shows our next profile and its mission to align, restore health, and to extend life. Thank you and have a great day po. So Doc, share ko lang po yung video namin. Thank you. 
So thank you very much, Doctor. Back to you, Doctor Malapas. Thank you very much, Pao. And uh, as far as accord is concerned, Sir Sal Borja, could you discuss with us very quickly your business portfolio and who you are as an organization? Nakamute kaya ta, Sir Sal, no? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me now? So yes, in behalf, perfect. Okay. In behalf of Accord uh, DKS, DKSH, we are very delighted and honored to be a partner of this uh, Best Cancer Awareness uh, Lecture. As we all know, Accord is a very young and dynamic company. So our presence in the UK has been very successful and what's good news about this, and it was extended here in Asia, especially here in the Philippines because of their very good experience of the patients and healthcare professionals in Europe. So we started our oncology journey here in back in 2018 and we are very much delighted to, to share with you on how we can partner with you better. Our presence in UK, Europe uh, and around the world would ensure that our products are at par with the strictest requirements of US FDA EMRA, which is the regulatory body in Europe and Australia, and also Brazil, uh, without to mention and, and any other countries we, that we are present, we have fulfilled those. So our uh, innovative products, our PharmaShield technology would ensure that our uh, healthcare professionals are very much secured and that uh, securing that our products would not compromise its quality from breakage and to usage of our patients and our onco nurses, pharmacists, and to the doctors as well. So here, uh, we are also building partnerships with our healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. We conduct also a drug safety handling seminar from drug receiving usage and drug disposal as well. So our available brands also here, we are continuously expanding our oncology portfolio as we know it demands uh, with the growing demands of and increasing our uh, incidence of breast cancer and all, also other types of cancers as well. So looking forward to travel with you further, uh, doctors, nurses, and all our patients with Accord's evolution in innovative healthcare in bringing to you quality and affordable uh, oncology products. Thank you very much, Pa. Thank you very much, Mr. Sal Borja from Accord, the evolution of genetics. So, uh, Ma'am Lirio, I would like to turn over the floor to you and Dr. Norge as we wind up our hostilities for today. By the way, as your moderator, thank you, and it's been a pleasure moderating for you. God bless you, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so last quiz. Bago maputol. <laughs> yes. Last quiz, Doc. Okay. So question. our last quiz. Last question. Winner. Quiz. The winner for this quiz Sorry. will win a free, free mammogram and breast ultrasound. So they can, they can claim it at the Medical City South Luzon. Okay, thank you very much to the Department of Surgery for sponsoring this free, yes. also our sponsors for sponsoring this free mammogram and breast ultrasound. Now, our question for the winner. 
Ayan, we will yes. since the 14th anniversary of TMCSN, so the 14th winner will get the uh, prize. Yes. So for so, all attendees, here is the question. Both, doc, both for Anena, Zoom and yes. FB. Yes. So we have one winner. So they okay. can type in their they comment nila yung kanilang answer. Then bibilangin po ng team natin kasi yung pang 14 na nakakuha ng tamang sagot. Okay, so complete the statement. So lagi na natin nasa nasabi yan kanina. Early detection, blank. Saves money, saves lives, early surgery, or early treatment. Go! Wow, bilis! <laughs> okay, so the answer for this, of course, is early detection. Support na ba? Saves lives. Letter D. Okay? So, the winner for this will be posted later. Sasabihin so, natin. Ipopost na lang natin sa FB page ng The Medical City South Luzon yung name and, ng winner. And sa registration naman, nandun yung email. Yes. Diba? So, pwede yes, email no. natin. So, I will proceed now for my closing remarks. Again, uh, I would like to thank the sponsors uh, DKSH Accord Medtronic for for uh, helping us with this webinar. I would like also to thank all the attendees, our beloved patients and doctors. Uh, thank you for uh, celebrating and attending this webinar here with us. Okay, so slide please. In behalf of the Department of Surgery, I would like to promote Yan. We, 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 the Medical City South Luzon will also launch the Women Care Package, no? mammogram, or, uh, mammogram or mammogram with breast ultrasound. And then soon, hindi lang umabot for today's session, no? we will launch, hopefully by next week, the Breast Biopsy Package. So for either Core Needle Biopsy Package or Excision Biopsy Package for the Medical City South Luzon. And of course, ongoing right now, no, you can you can approach any surgeon, any general surgeon, or or doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Would like to promote our lap cholec package. So for the details of this, please consult any of our surgeons. And of course, in consultation, all the panels is available as clinic in our hospital, the Medical City South Luzon. You may call these numbers and also you can contact us via our FB page and Viber group to set an appointment for our surgeons. Not only this panelist, there are a lot of general surgeons and specialists in the, in the hospital that can cater in all your needs. So, yun. so you can contact this number for your appointment. So appointment can be face-to-face -face or via teleconsult. So again, everyone, thank you. In behalf of the Department of Surgery, thank you very much and have a pleasant morning ahead of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much, Paul.